Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the June 26th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Good morning. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Supervisor Kunitry? Here. Supervisor Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Chair Friend? Here. If you could please join us in a moment of silence on the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, we have a number of uh, corrections. On the consent agenda, item number seven, uh, there's additional materials. There's a revised attachment B, minutes of June 12, 2018. <clears throat> On item number 78, staff requests that this item be deleted. Item 79 should read, Continued public hearing to consider certification of the vote results for county service area numbers 23 Old Ranch Road, 28 Loman Terrace, 36 Forest Glen, B Hayward Zone, and 59 McGaffkin Mill Road, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO Director of Public Works um, item continued from June 12, 2018. Staff requests that this item be moved to the regular agenda as uh, item 89.1. There's an addenda to the consent agenda. There's addenda item 83.1, which is to authorize the chair to write a letter to Senator Weiner and our legislative delegation in support of Senate Bill 822 as amended in the California State Senate prior to amendments made in the Assembly Communications and Conveyance Committee on June 20, 2018 as recommended by Supervisor Friend. Item 83.2, approve contract change order in the amount of $137,138.62 for the Aptos Village Improvements Phase One project and take related actions as recommended by the Deputy CAO Director of Public Works. And item 83.3, approve independent contractor agreement with Hope Services for Labor Services for mixed recoverable materials sorting and recycling operations at the county's Buena Vista landfill from July 21, 2018 to Ju June 30, 2022 in the not to exceed amount of $90,000 per fiscal year and take related actions as recommended by the Deputy CAO De Director of Public Works. That concludes the uh, corrections. Thank you. Uh, we'll now begin with the consent agenda. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Caput. Are there any items you'd like to briefly comment on or any items you'd like to pull on the consent agenda? Well, I'll just comment. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, on item 30 and 32, they're both related on uh, separation of families uh, at the border. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, a terrible thing that's going on. And uh, we, we've got to, We've got to come up with something that's more humane and uh, treat people with respect. Uh, papers uh, don't make people uh, uh, either good or bad. So uh, when somebody is uh, being detained, uh, you can't, uh, you can't uh, blame uh, the children for, that, are being in, that are involved in this at all. And uh, they, they really need respect and they need uh, humane treatment uh, at the border, regardless of uh, uh, how anybody believes uh, they are innocent. To the children being <coughs> separated from their mother or father is, uh, is not, uh, it's not a good reflection on our country. Uh, we are a country of immigrants, and uh, we have to show the world that we are uh, uh, treating people with uh, respect and dignity. So, and, and also families with respect and dignity. So anyway, I'm, I'm uh, happy that we have that on our agenda today. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Capic. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, agreed. Um, item number 16, I wanna just thank the uh, county administrative officer and the whole team and the effort that we had to, 
to get this, our county strategic plan, this place for 2018 to 2024. It's a great step forward. It's going to give us uh, and the general public a, a better idea of where we are and where we're going. And uh, I want to congratulate you. It's been uh, a two-year effort, and it's to, everybody's to be commended who worked on it so much, and thank you very much. Um, on uh, item number 39, I, I think it's great, uh, another cooperative effort with the Volunteer Center to operate the court referral program from uh, July of uh, this year to June 30th, 2021. Especially want to thank uh, Karen Delaney of Volunteer Services, or the Volunteer Center, and Jim Raposa <laughs> for uh, putting this together, and the probation officer, our probation team too, that. Uh, put this in place. This is going to be a really great cooperative effort to help a lot of people that, that can use some direct attention. Um, also on items number 43 and 4, uh, the report on the homeless outreach and the serial inebriate program, um, not all in the same, but uh, uh, they're, they're, they are pretty much uh, work together. Uh, we're doing a lot to try to address some uh, relatively new serious problems serious, uh, to the degree that they are today and I think we've done a very good job and um, our health services and human services have done a terrific job of outreach and trying to get a program so we can reach more people that need some help and uh, we're going to be able to provide it with a good plan of attack that we have now I believe. And um, number uh, 60 and 61, uh, it's finally arrived, it's going to happen. The library, we're going to approve these plans and specifications for the engineer's estimate and authorize the calling for bids for the Felton Library. This has been a long time coming and there's been a tremendous amount of people in the San Lorenzo Valley who have waited a long time for this to happen and it's going to be a really good um, cooperative effort with a park, uh, right, a Discovery Park right next to it, adjacent to it. Uh, first of its kind in the state of California, I believe. So it's uh, it's really exciting news <coughs> and to approve the contractor agreement with Bogart Construction. Um, we're, we're ready to go and I think ground will be broken this fall and uh, we'll have a library a year from this fall in Felton. It'll be a real great asset for the uh, people of uh, San Lorenzo Valley and the entire Santa Cruz County community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just a couple uh, items to comment on. First is item number 18, which is our integrated pet management report. I'm um, glad to see that we're reducing our use to, uh, uh, toxic pesticides. Uh, we need to keep uh, reducing our use uh, our, uh, to wean ourselves off of rodenticides. I think we set good policies in our cannabis, um, for our cannabis growers locally, and um, the county should be following suit over this year. On items number 30 and 30, as was mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's shocking and uh, sickening the policies that our federal government is currently engaging in is separating families and harming children uh, and uh, using basically children as a political tool. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, locally we're renouncing it and I hope that um, our country changes course quickly. Uh, on item number 35, uh, the Childhood Advisory Council, um, I thought it was an excellent report and I want to uh, appreciate their effort to basically acknowledge the uh, lack of child care resources, but then figure out uh, new methods of funding and potentially uh, ways to increase the availability of child care, for, especially for working families in our community. And then finally on item number 81, which is the Davenport uh, Waterline Project, I want to give a special thanks out to Ken Edler, who identified uh, the USDA grant, uh, which was able to uh, get these water lines restored to keep water flowing to the community uh, without uh, forcing uh, this that small community to bear the full cost of that repair. So, really good works to uh, really good work by Public Works uh, and Ken Edler, and specifically. So, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, comments on on some of the items. Um, as was stated on item 30 and 32, uh, this is a, hor a horrific practice that our government is engaged in and I'm glad that we're taking a stand here reflecting where everybody that I talk to uh, is at and it is not an effective means uh, to um, stop illegal immigration. It's an effective means to ruin families and traumatize kids for the rest of their lives. 
Um, on item number 39, which is the agreement with the Volunteer Center to operate the court referral program, uh, Community Options has, uh, has done a, a very good job over many years uh, to run this program, but I was glad to see that it was incorporated as part of the Volunteer Center and we're expanding uh, some of the services and the way we do it uh, to uh, better support people who um, uh, could fulfill their responsibilities in other ways other than being incarcerated uh, and also contributing back to the community. Um, on item number 45, I was really glad to see this memorandum of understanding with Cabrillo College about the nurse residency program. Uh, we have an incredible resource uh, at Cabrillo College. Uh, their nurse nursing program is one of the highest rated in the state. Um, and the fact that our health services agency is doing a partnership so uh, we could uh, have students interested in public health uh, is a win on uh, every single level, uh, both for, the, uh, for both institutions and the people involved and the community at large. On item number 52, which is the Winter Storm Projects update, um, uh, I appreciate this information and I would request that in future reports we also get the priority list um, so we can match w the projects in, in progress with uh, the ones that we've designated as high priority so we can be able to share that with people. And if I, it, it, that could be an additional direction um, uh, to come back with a report um, uh, w with the priority list as well. Uh, but I appreciate the work that has gone on to, to help uh, uh, repair the storm damaged roads. On item number 71, uh, uh, I'm glad to see that we're approving these agreements with both the Gray Bears and the Valley Women's Club. They provide an incredibly important service in uh, being a site where people can bring recyclables um, and uh, divert uh, items from our waste stream. Uh, this is incredibly important. Uh, as we talked about during the budget hearings, we have a limited lifespan on, on our landfill. So anything that we can divert um, adds the life of that uh, and saves us a lot of money. So this is a small amount to pay to support two good community organizations uh, and, and help the county as well. Uh, the last item is uh, item 83.1, which is the letter about uh, SB 822. I completely agree that Senator Wiener's bill um, was a great bill when it started, and it has been um, bastardized w in uh, committee. Uh, I think we should we should clearly say that we oppose the current bill unless it's amended back to, to what it was. And I just want to make sure that the letter that, get, that gets reflected um, in the letter, because uh, this says support a a uh, twenty two as amended prior prior to the amendments made in the assembly uh, communications. And I just think we need to oppose the bill currently because it's, it's, it's not what they claim it to be. That's fine, as the, as the individual that brought forward that item, since the, it is a little bit of a confusing title, it kind of has a double negative, it makes more sense uh, to have the language that Supervisor Leopold's asking for, it has the exact same effect. Thank you for those uh, changes. What was the item that you were looking for, the additional direction again? Uh, the storm uh, damage item, item number 52. 52, thank uh, you. Which was the public works winter storm update. So I have a couple of brief comments and an additional direction on item 16, which is a strategic plan. I'd, I'd like to add some additional direction, which is uh, when the CAO returns on September 25th, that if feasible, to add a line to our future agenda reports uh, after the financial impact that shows what strategic plan goal the item is related to, so that all items that come forward from staff just have a line that we can show is connected to the strategic plan or, or not uh, on future items. But I'll leave it as this, if feasible, since I'm not familiar enough with the agenda management system to know how easy that is to do or not. But when you come back on, on the 25th, then uh, just a brief thing on that. I appreciate my colleagues on item 30. Obviously, item 30 and 32 are related. Item 32 I brought forward, which was in part to support Senator Feinstein's uh, uh, Senate Bill 3036, which is to keep the Families Together Act, uh, which is in response uh, to the actions that are occurring right now on the border. I think that uh, uh, considering the fact that there's 49 co-sponsors for that, it's a clue that uh, there's a lot of good elements in that bill and, and would actually set forward policy, I think, for the country that's much better than what we're doing right now. On 83.1, which is the item that I brought forward regarding Senator Wiener's bill, it's just, uh, 
in support of net neutrality before the current administration killed el every element associated with that. Uh, he had a bill that was, in many respects, gutted in the assembly, and this is to show support for his original bill or as Senator, uh, excuse me, as Supervisor uh, Leopold noted, to oppose the amended bill and to support uh, the bill that was originally in the Senate. And that's all that, that I have on consent. I'd like to open it up for the community to speak briefly on items on consent. If there's anybody that would like to address us on items on consent, now would be your opportunity. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of Aptos, and I would um, like to pull two items from the consent agenda to be put on the regular agenda, please. Item number um, 83.2, which was recently added to the consent agenda, and item 74. Are there any other items you want to comment on? Yes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, regarding item 12, approval, um, by the county to hold full certifi certificate of financial responsibility for petroleum underground storage tanks. I would like to hear that this is a, a, some assurance that this will be only for um, underground storage tanks on county property and could not include any possible action regarding uh, USTs on private property such as the Aptos Village Project. Item 16, um, I have a lot of concerns about the uh, strategic plan. I see in today's um, agenda for your meeting that public comment has been put at the very end of today's rather than at the beginning, and I do not think that this is in keeping with the intent of uh, increased public input and transparency um, with your local government process. So um, I have questions about how the strategic plan af um, affects or may weigh in on that. On item number 56, I would like to publicly thank the Director of Public Works, Mr. Machado, for responding so promptly to my questions about this um, item yesterday. He's a great asset to this county and I really, as a member of the public, appreciate him. Um, and I believe that's all that I, oh yes, item number 78, um, vacating a portion of McGregor Drive right of way adjacent to 2000 Ms. McGregor Steinbrenner, Drive. Uh, that item, I'm sorry, before you showed up was actually deleted uh, per staff's oh. request, yeah. Okay, thank you for letting me know, thank you. That's all I have to comment on. Uh, we'll make uh, item 7486.1 and, and item 83.286.2 .2 on the regular much. agenda. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on consent? Marilyn Garrett, a 37 year resident of Aptos. And I'd also like to say for item 12, the underground storage tanks, the county being financially responsible, I, uh, the, the, Becky made a correct statement. This should be only on county owned property because on private property, those who put the tanks in and are responsible for any removal or spill, that should be the responsibility of those who own the tanks and put them in. The county, with our taxpayer money, should not be picking up that tab. It's improper. Um, the items 18 and 19, uh, the integrated pest management program um, changes and crane pest control. Um, pesticides are toxic. We need non-toxic methods of pest control. I have to look at that. Um, when county supervisors Peary and Stone were on the board 
after about five years of effort, uh, we in the county were able to stop the county roadside spraying of Roundup all over. It was a lot of effort, and I want to be assured that the county is not reverting back to using this um, Monsanto toxic pesticide on the roadsides. Um, um, item, let's see, the one is at 75, um, act, what is it, active transportation program, pedestrian improvements on Green Valley Road. Um, I would like some specifics to that. This is your area, I think, Supervisor Caput. Um, these radar signs are highly dangerous. I want to be assured that those are not part of the pedestrian safety. Radar is not safe, it's highly damaging. And lastly, I wanted to commend you, Supervisor Caput and Coonerty, for item 30 on the uh, separation of uh, families at the border. To me, what I've been hearing, this is, this is kidnapping. This is child kidnapping, and I've heard that some of the parents are being deported back to their country while the children are here. And looking at U.S. history, it's not surprising. Slavery, indigenous people. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. And uh, it, it is an outrage. Thank you for that resolution. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on consent? Mr. Alexander, welcome. Thank you. Sorry about that, it's hard to produce your own videos. But I wanna be able to, before I pivot into my public comment, because I, I know that the uh, uh, oral communication is put off to the back, but I just wanna remind the members of the public what it is to be a good flag waving Americans, because we are good people, and I do appreciate you guys. Um, you, I, I wanna be able to, before I go into this, I just wanna be able to object to the procedure of burying the oral communication or the public comment at the very end, switching it up. I would say that we need to have a steering committee, a public comment steering committee. And I, and I, know, I know that it's off the topic, but it's procedural. Yeah. How am I gonna protest? Yeah. How, how am I gonna be able to let members of the public know that they're burying the, the public comment? I can't, there's Mr. Alexander, just speak to consent. Just speak to the consent items. Uh, oral communications was time certain at 1.30 because this meeting goes on until three o'clock or later today because of budget hearings. We were trying to actually have it at a time that people would know when it would be so that people could show up. It's actually a convenience issue. It's not, the accusations are what they are, but speak to the items on consent, which is what we're doing right now. Yeah, I, I do apologize for uh, being recalcitrant, but I'm just passionate about the public comment. I would say we need to put, put it back at the beginning because people can't wait to the very end. In San Jose, San Jose City, uh, the city meetings, they put public comment. People have to wait to two o'clock in the morning. I would like it going back at the beginning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So anybody else that, specific to the consent agenda or the board will take item on consent? Thank you for waiting. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Richard Lewis. Um, basically, I came here for um, on the consent, but I'm really happy to see that on September 25th, and that's the, uh, I thought you might have pulled it. I don't wanna pull it. I just wanna acknowledge Carlos's work in putting a, I think since sliced bread, that possibility that all of you who are sitting up there, I remember John's comment about concern for reaching out to the Latino community. Um, I've passed out some of these to some of the stakeholders prior from a group in Oakland. I'm not gonna expect any of you to see the research, but key, youth voice and student empowerment is this international human right. And if there's ever been somebody coming from a community now running our county, it's our CEO. And so I look forward to coming back on the 25th and share I just wanna share that this Green Mine Institute is possibly like with strategic planning. There are so many organizations outside our county. The, the people who sponsored their summit is just tremendous. So today I'm, I'm gonna ask if you remember USAID and how we're all concerned with what's happening at the border 
there's reason why in other countries this is coming. So I don't want to pull, but I want to acknowledge each of you to see what we can do uh, with on the 25th concrete process next steps. So I'm honored to try to pass on to some of you, as you know, I've tried to communicate that for six years we have a county structure. Coming up since sliced bread, let's see what we can do differently in our county to connect to state and federal resources. So I'm honored to be here, but um, I did come. I thought we'd have another presentation, but I'm honored to see that we're gonna have something different coming up on the 25th. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on consent? Good morning. Good morning, thank you for My waiting. My name is Lynn Miller, and I'm the, I guess, outgoing president of Community Options. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the Board of Supervisors, the County Administrative Office, the Probation Department for working with us in this transition. Um, it's been a Herculean task for our staff to get this done, they've done it. Um, Karen and Jim Raposa have been instrumental in making this work. But more than anything else, I want to thank this board on behalf of the people that can't speak today, won't know about this until they have the opportunity of going through this system. Those are the important ones you helped today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Anybody else on consent? Okay, seeing none, is, uh, we'll bring back to the board. Is there a motion I'll for the amended? The I'll move. As amended. <clears throat> we have a motion from Supervisor uh, Leopold, a second from Supervisor Caput for the amended consent agenda, including two items that have been uh, pulled. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll now move on to the regular agenda. First item is item 84, which is a presentation by pg &E regarding the community wildfire uh, safety program and implications for Santa Cruz County and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Director of General Services. Mr. Bean, are you gonna introduce this item before pg &E speaks? Yes. Great. On the base, on the base. Yeah, at the base. Good morning, Mr. Bean. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Board Chair Friend, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. On March 22nd of this year, PG&E PG &E announced uh, the release of a new comprehensive community wildfire safety program. Over the last few months, county staff, including CAL FIRE, have been meeting with representatives of PG&E to understand the local impacts uh, of its implementation. Here today to give an overview of PG&E's community wildfire safety program and its potential local impacts to Santa Cruz County are Joe Foster, government relations representative, and Greg Lemler, vice president of Elect electric transmission operations, who happens to also oversee the emergency preparedness and response for PG&E. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Mr. Foster, are you introducing this item for PG&E? Uh, yes, Chair Friend. Uh, thank uh, you, members please. Of Members of the board, thank you for having us here today. And uh, Mr. Beaton, thank you for the introduction. So uh, as mentioned, we've, um, we're introducing our community wildfire safety program. We met with the county a, a few months ago, met with the administration to uh, start conversations about this program and the importance of the work and, and what we're planning to do going forward. Uh, and we've since then held a subsequent meeting with county OES to discuss communications around this program, particularly on the topic of a power, a public safety power shutoff, which we'll discuss in detail during the presentation. We, there are actually three main components to this program. Uh, one is the, the proactive uh, public safety power shutoff aspect of it. Another is uh, increased vegetation management practices that we will uh, be talking about at length here shortly. And uh, the last one is what we call hardening of our electric system. So looking at opportunities to bolster uh, both wires, poles, uh, infrastructure related to our transmission and distribution system uh, in the event uh, or in areas that are at particular risk of uh, threat of wildfire and uh, safety issues. So. Um, as mentioned, uh, Greg Limler is here with me today. He's the Vice President of Electric Transmission Operations. Um, I'll let him talk a little bit about his role with that as well as his role in our safety organization and uh, hand the presentation over to Greg. Uh, it's uh, about a 15 to 20 slide presentation, so 
we'll try to get through it as quickly as possible and hopefully we can hold questions until the end of the presentation. So thank you. Good morning, Mr. Lindler. Thank you for being here. Yeah, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share our community uh, wildfire plan with you this morning. Um, we believe it's a really important opportunity for us to address the kind of the changing uh, climate conditions we're experiencing here in California. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's just the reality and we have been taking proactive steps to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the public safety is, is uh, considered and uh, make sure that uh, we, uh, we can meet the requirements going forward, yet providing our, our electricity to the homes and businesses in, uh, in, our, in the northern central California uh, safely. So what I'd like to do is just uh, share with you kind of uh, the three areas we are, we're, we're following and go through a little more in detail. Um, we are really been focused on uh, uh, a how do we bolster and get ahead of uh, file, uh, wildfire prevention and emergency response. Um, and we have set up a, a, a new wildfire safety operations center that's monitoring and working with CAL FIRE, monitoring fires in the area, weather conditions, other conditions that, it, that uh, will trigger wildfires, wind, low humidity, high fuel load, et cetera. Um, we have that man or uh, staff 24 seven in our San Francisco office. We just opened that facility uh, earlier uh, this month. It went, uh, uh, excuse me, in, uh, in May of this year. Uh, we're also uh, uh, expanding uh, the weather stations that are in the state uh, that are not only used by uh, the National Weather Service but also the state of California, CAL FIRE. And as you know, there's a lot of microclimates in, this, in our state and we're trying to put up weather stations in those high risk area, fire risk areas uh, and try to get more detailed granular information of uh, weather conditions and issues. And then we are, we're looking at a wildfire infrastructure protection team that we're bringing in uh, uh, to help us to, when we go into these high risk areas, especially during the summer to work on our facilities, whether energized lines, uh, we wanna make sure we're doing that safely, our crews are safe, uh, and make sure that if, if anything is, if there are any problems that we can mitigate those quickly. We've also been uh, working with uh, communities to enhance our, uh, our safety measures uh, we're we're de-energizing our lines. We have a public safety uh, uh, shutdown program uh, that's really our last resort if we have to. We're also disabling what we call our reclosers, or there's automatic switches that we have on our lines. Um, and I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but when the power goes out, sometimes the power will come back in in like 30 seconds, and then it'll either go back out again or it'll stay back on. What that is is that's an automatic switch that senses the the power and if, the, and if there's a problem on the line, um, it will, it'll keep the power out. So what we're doing is if there is concerns of a wire down or something uh, of that nature, we don't want to make, we don't want that power to, or that line to re-energize. So we're going through and we've actually are uh, de disabling that, uh, that, that capability. And we do it on a, we have both manual switches and automatic switches. Uh, the manual switches we've already de de uh, uh, disabled um, and we are in the process and when we get into certain conditions, we will do that automatically from our control centers. And then we're also looking at uh, how do we enhance our, our vegetation and vegetation management in these high extreme areas. And then finally, we're looking at what can we do in the long term to uh, strengthen the resiliency of the electric transmissions or the electric system um, but in these high fire risk areas and modifying designs with coated wire, with replacing power poles with uh, non-wood products, uh, and then also working with communities to develop microgrids where we have to. So if we do have to shut off power in some of these areas, uh, those residents in those areas have an opportunity or a place to go. And how do we keep electricity to those, some of those facilities? So let me, let me get into uh, some of what, what's driving a lot of this. And the CPUC uh, issued a, this fire, uh, high fire threat district map back in January. And you can see it uh, it's really identifies those, those high fire areas, both tier two and tier three. Uh, tier three is the extreme. Uh, we, that's the area where we will be uh, taking proactive measures to shut off power if conditions are such as a last resort. 
Um, but tier two and three are, are really the high risk areas that, uh, that the commission has identified in working with uh, CAL FIRE and others. Um, it's interesting, if you looked at this map uh, probably 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was very spotted. It wasn't basically now most of the coastal range and the, uh, the Sierras has become high risk. And I think, again, that's uh, uh, prevalent due to our, the changing climate that we're seeing in California. Here is a, a, a kind of a, a, a zoom in on, uh, on Santa Clara, uh, excuse me, Santa Cruz County. Um, and you can see quite a bit of the county is, is uh, gonna be impacted or is impacted, it has a tier three and tier two. The, the chart on the lower uh, left are those uh, communities and those customers, uh, uh, homes and businesses that would be affected if we had to proactively shut off the power in those tier three areas. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude. Um, again, proactively, what have we been doing? We have a new uh, wildfire safety operations center um, and, and that basically is monitoring 24 seven wildfire conditions. Again, working with the state and CAL FIRE and, uh, and uh, local districts on how do we respond to fires? How do we get prepared? Um, this is more of a central monitoring, the weather conditions like I mentioned, it monitors um, all those things that may trigger and or uh, uh, extend a wildfire. The other thing that, is so, so what we do is in combination with uh, central monitoring, if we do have these conditions that are identified, um, we have a report that comes out that looks out seven days based on weather forecasts and that weather forecast then identifies whether it's uh, all the way up to an extreme type condition and we monitor then, we will send out first responders, uh, PG&E troublemen, others to kind of get field, uh, uh, monitor the conditions in the field in those areas that we've identified as extreme uh, to get their eyes on the ground looking at uh, whether, you know, we've got high winds where things are starting to blow into our lines or things of that nature. Uh, before we make a call as far as de-energizing. Um, in the public safety uh, shutoff program that we mentioned, this is new for us. Um, this again is really a last resort type effort. We certainly don't wanna do this. This is really, um, when, when it comes to public safety, uh, obviously uh, fire is, is a higher priority than keeping the lights on, but uh, we don't take it lightly. We wanna ideally keep the lights on. It kinda goes against our grain of, of our business of keeping the lights on. But uh, again, like I mentioned, with the new normal in California, we, uh, we have to do this as a proactive measure. So uh, like I mentioned, we are, we're doing the monitoring on those high fire risk areas. And again, this is only for tier three areas that you, that you saw on the map earlier. Um, and then what we plan to do is anywhere between, it could be just an hour or it could be up to 24 uh, or 48 hours where we're gonna notify uh, communities, we're gonna notify customers in those areas about the, p the possibility of us uh, uh, proactively shutting off power. Um, and then once we do shut off power, we're gonna have to wait until the conditions are such that it allows us, you know, the wind starts dying down, et cetera, the weather conditions are right. And before we will energize those lines, we have to do a, a, a visual a view of those lines or patrol those lines completely, just to make sure that there isn't a wire down, there is another condition, a tree branch or tree lane in our line that could start a fire. So uh, once the line is out of service, it will be out of service uh, for, for a longer uh, than, than typical because we're gonna have to, again, uh, visually put eyes on it to make sure there aren't any other hazards before we re-energize. Uh, so I talked about this a little bit, frequent frequency, um, it's really gonna depend. We're, it, at this point, it's a guesstimate, may happen once or twice a, uh, during the fire season. It may not, it may happen more often, we don't know. Uh, it's really kind of new this year, we're, we're exploring that, we're trying to figure out how to make that happen. But uh, based on what we're seeing so far this year and the fires that we're seeing in California, I would expect that we will be uh, shutting off power proactively again and hopefully notifying customers in those areas uh, quickly enough 
And again, our target has been, is at least 24 hours. And many of it we will try to, again, it's a seven day forecast. We'll try to get out as early as we can and notify as the possibility. The challenge for us is we just don't wanna cry wolf kind of things too often because as the weather conditions change, it, it fluctuates and it can fluctuate up to 24 hours. So um, again, we're gonna be working on that, but our goal is to give as much advance notice uh, to everyone that's gonna be affected as possible. Um, so again, uh, but, but it also can depend. So good example, the Pardee fire up in Clear Lake. Um, we did not proactively shut off power other than what the CAL FIRE requested us do for, for their safety. Um, but we also then, as the fire was moving into areas, we proactively shut off the power. But again, most of those customers were evacuated already or, or out of the area. Um, you know, we're right in the middle of our outreach program. We've sent out letters to uh, all of our customers in the tier three area that are effective. We've been going around to uh, many county uh, community uh, as, as much as possible and we're continuing to do that to uh, share what we're doing, how we're doing it, gathering feedback on what we can do to get better. Uh, this is kind of a new normal for us as well. So we're all learning through this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this event and what we're setting up on going forward on our plan. Um, one thing we are doing is we're really focusing on also customers like we have in the past around being prepared for any emergency, whether it's an earthquake, wildfire, anything else, we, we believe it's really important for everyone uh, to be prepared for the worst case scenario, plan for the worst and expect the best has always been our motto. Uh, and we really encourage customers to make sure they're, they're, they're prepared for it. And, and one of them is not only just to have, you know, batteries for their smoke alarms, fire extinguishers, firefighting protection to get them out of the area, but also an emergency plan and practicing. And just simple things like, how do you manually open your garage door when the power goes out and things like that. And thinking about if I didn't have power, what do I need to do to be prepared? Another part of our program is enhanced, uh, is we're enhancing the width and the, the, our type of vegetation management in both the tier two and three areas. Um, excuse me, in the tier three areas, a new, there's a new state requirement for us that uh, our clearing requirement's gonna have to go to from a foot and a half on either side of a line on our distribution circuits to now four feet. And to do that, as you know, we're, and, and in addition to that, in the past we would trim typically around a circuit. Now we're gonna be trimming from the ground to the sky. So it'll be clear on either side. It's very similar to the way we uh, do our vegetation management on the transmission system, the large, the large transmission system that go, wires that go through. Um, we're gonna be doing that for our distribution circuits as well. Um, and, what that re will require us to do is the minimum clearance is four feet on either side. We're gonna have to actually clear out further than that, unfortunately, but that's, that's and then uh, provide some protection around that. So here's kind of a, uh, what we're looking at. We're right, really trying to create what we're calling and, and working with the fire uh, organizations on a, a fire defense zone under the lines. It's interesting, uh, Cal Fire and others I've actually used these, uh, some of these, uh, these corridors and these zones as um, uh, defense zones for, for their fires and their firefighting capabilities. Um, and I mentioned the recloser procedure in our program, we're already implemented that, so our lines don't automatically reclose into, the, uh, into these areas, some of these areas that will require us to, again, patrol lines and we'll probably have outages that'll last longer than we typically have had in the past. Um, and then finally, our hardening program. We've been on a, on a mission to uh, modernize our, uh, our electric uh, system for, for several years now. Uh, we've in invested well over a billion dollars, 15 billion dollars, and we continue to do that going forward. And we're, again, modifying our uh, design and, and in these high risk areas where we're gonna be coating the lines right now, they're bare aluminum. We're gonna have what we, uh, it's gonna have a light insulation on it. We call it tree wire. So if a branch or something falls into the line or grows, goes across two phases of a line, it won't automatically ignite. It'll able to uh, protect it from, from that. 
We're also looking to spread our circuit, wi or the wires further apart. So there's more ability for those lines not to slap together in high wind conditions and things of that nature. And then also replacing um, uh, many of these wood, wood poles in these areas with uh, non-wood type uh, poles. Just to give you an idea, we have well over 13,000 miles of distribution circuit that go through these tier three within our service territory that we're gonna have to be, that we're gonna be working on over the many next several years and beyond. And uh, that's really the extent of it. I guess here's some opportunities. We'd ask, um, one thing we're asking customers now is to really visit our uh, pg.com uh, forward slash wildfire safety. Uh, we're really interested in getting uh, current information and contact information from them so we can notify them during, uh, during these conditions. Um, and there's also quite a bit of other uh, good information on that, on that website. We encourage uh, uh, everyone to go to that site for additional information. So with that, I'll stop and open it up for questions. Uh, thank you, we'll bring it back to the board. I, I do have a couple of quick questions and some comments. Um, you, you know, I really think this is actually a very significant change of, uh, of process. It could have significant impacts on uh, residents throughout the unincorporated portions of the county. Um, while you touched on it, I didn't quite feel satisfied on a couple of elements, which is why I, I would like to get some greater clarification. Uh, reading from one of your slides, you said, if we need to turn off power, we will attempt to contact customers in advance to prepare. Um, the next slide, you said that could be a one hour to 48 hour notification. Um, you know, the attempt versus that we will is, is, is disconcerting to say the least. Uh, secondly, one hour to 48 hours is not a lot of uh, notification. Re residents, I mean, predicted storm events people start to prepare for. Um, events that don't really seem in your consciousness to be causing any issues in the community that you are shutting off power proactively for reasons that you determine to be problematic uh, are harder for somebody to be able to prepare for, obviously. Um, I have concerns of my rural residents that rely on home dialysis or oxygen, for example, <clears throat> life, uh, necessity elements. Um, I didn't see something in here that specified that pg &E would be setting up, you know, emergency centers for these people, that they would have enough time to be able to commute down or be, receive transportation, emergency transportation down. So what is pg &E doing on those, in those regards? Again, I have constituents that have told me when we had the last winter, when we would receive these notifications from Mr. Foster, we would share that information widely that they would leave their residence because they had enough notification to go find locations where they would have power for these issues. I don't have confidence in this situation my residents are gonna have that same uh, level of notification. And I, I don't really, um, I mean, it's obviously a problem. It's not uh, of how people are gonna be able to live legitimately in these situations. So what is pg &E's plan? I mean, A, it shouldn't be a we will attempt. It should be we will contact. B, it should be better than an hour. I mean. And C, there needs to be some sort of situation by which people that have these life-threatening issues that rely on the power grid to actually keep them at home and alive, uh, that there's some sort of center set up or some sort, something that PG&E is funding to ensure that happens. So if you could address those, I'd appreciate it. You bet, and I'll let Joe add, uh, add his comments as well. Um, the, the reason we say attempt, we will. We're gonna, we're gonna proactively try to uh, contact everyone that's gonna be affected. The challenge for us is we're relying on those customers to provide us information uh, that we can contact them, them with. So we're, we actually, and that's one of the requests we have, is we don't have accurate uh, information for every uh, customer in those locations, but that's what we're asking for. We're gonna need that other end of it, and we're gonna make every attempt possible, not only through direct contact, we're gonna be, if they want us to text them, we'll do that. Call them, we'll do that. We're gonna be doing it through social media. We're gonna be doing it through the media. We're gonna do it for every communication uh, avenue available to us. The challenge again for us is not, we say attempt because we really are depending on those customers to let us know. Some customers will let us know and are very good about that. Some customers won't and don't wanna give us that information. So that's really, why that kind of wording in, is in there. Now the, 
the, the I, I kind of brushed on it, but we're really trying to set up uh, community centers and the idea of these microgrids to make sure that those community centers have power. Um, and that in, the intent of that is if we do have to shut off power, <laughs> those customers, whether medical or any other customers that are affected, have a place to go. Um, that's the purpose of that. And we'd love to, and I know we're working uh, with, with your county and, and others to have those co and other communities to make sure we have those things. Where's the best location? How do we do it? How do we set up microgrid type, whether it's a solar battery type combination or a generator or whatever is required to make sure those, those centers have power. So, and then on the medical customers, we have a pretty good database. We also know the county has a pretty good database. Um, and we're trying to do that. Now the challenge for us is that, that the reason it's down to one hour is this is not, <coughs> we have a, th there are so many changing variables as you know with the weather. Um, the, that is really the, we, our intent as far as I'm concerned, we're gonna notify everybody as soon as we know or suspect we're gonna have a problem which will be 48 hours plus. The challenge for us though is that, that can, as the weather changes and conditions change, that's gonna vary. And again, we're not gonna try to uh, shut off power unless we absolutely, absolutely have to. And we're not gonna make, wait to that one hour and make a call. We're gonna try to make that call early on. So again, we can notify people. And we're gonna try to let people know that it's gonna happen. It, it, there's a possibility of it happen and communicate that in addition to then it is gonna happen. So we're trying to get several phases of communication. Yeah, and just, just a couple things to add. So Chair Friend, you mentioned the um, current practices and what we've done historically as far as um, kind of giving a heads up and a warning of uh, potential impacts to our system related to weather or uh, conditions, extreme conditions. Uh, that won't change. We'll continue to be able to provide as much uh, heads up and warning as possible uh, through our normal, <coughs> excuse me, our normal channels. And then, um, but this will just be an added uh, component to the program um, overall. So uh, as Greg mentioned, we'll be doing our best to uh, give as much heads up as possible. I think one of the things that, that we all know, the areas in the, the map that were shaded as tier three, on a somewhat annual basis, they do experience long duration or frequent outages. And a lot of those outages happen without any kind of warning. So we are hoping that with this program, we are able to give a little bit more warning, a little bit more time for people to prepare. Um, we realize that it's not gonna happen overnight, that it's, and it's not gonna happen just with us uh, doing what we're doing. It's gonna take uh, partnership and coordination with the county, uh, as well as some community groups and partners in some of these areas. So those are things that we're looking at as well. Um, and then uh, I'm glad that Greg touched on the, the microgrids and trying to help uh, uh, set up some uh, shelters or places where we can uh, have people to be able to go if uh, they, they do need um, uh, a gathering spot, uh, whether it's uh, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains area, the Ben Lomond or the summit, we, that's something that we need to um, work on with, those com with the community and with the county. And one last thing, my colleagues I know would like to express some concerns as well. The, the biggest thing here uh, for you is the wildfire safety. The biggest thing for our constituents is the fact you're shutting the power off and, and you can't bury that lead on your website 50 pages in. I mean, this, this, you, there's gonna have to be a pretty significant outreach component to this. I mean, I, on your main page, it's buried. On this page, it's not the lead component of it. Um, I don't know that you have plans to speak to every jurisdiction in this kind of format. I don't know that you're gonna be sitting down with the newspapers. I don't know what kind of advertising you're gonna be doing, but I think that it's a, it's a big deal. People, people expect the water to, to come on when they turn on the tap. They expect the lights to be on, absent some sort of uncontrollable situation. This is something, in, in, in my opinion, that pg and is actually controlling. Now, you're making a determination on behalf of the community that that's, uh, conditions exist. That is a, that is a change of structure and I just think it's gonna have to be uh, communicated and expressed to people, especially people that are in vulnerable populations in a way that I don't know that you're there yet in, mm -hmm. in doing. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty and then Supervisor Leopold. Sure, so following up on Zach's question, which is um, the idea of microgrids and community centers or s for yeah. people that, yeah. will those be done in advance of this policy? Because I mean, potentially, how long will it take to set up microgrids across the Santa Cruz mountains or to identify community centers or to pull the lists. 
there's a sequencing issue here. Uh, and so is, are you gonna wait until those are in place before you enact this policy or are you gonna enact this policy and then work on these, these sort of measures af after that or concurrently? It'll, it'll likely be concurrently at this time because if, as Greg mentioned, and there will be, if there were conditions that presented themselves uh, in the near term future uh, that merited us feeling like we had to shut down power, we would have to do it for public safety. Um, that said, we, we, will, we, we are starting to work with um, both the county and with the other partners in the community to look at ways to set up, even if at this point it's just a facility with backup generation and identify spots where people can go. I think there already are some. Um, in fact, I know there are some that we've worked with in uh, past storm seasons. And uh, because as, as we mentioned, th these areas do experience long duration outages currently, uh, frequent outages currently. And um, we're hoping that uh, we'll continue to rely on the, the partners that we have at this point and that the community has at this point. But the key thing, and, and I just wanna go back to it really quickly, is ensuring that we do have con current contact information. We do know how to reach these people. Um, some of these accounts have been open 30, 35 years. And at that point, may have been a phone number that's been long since been disconnected. And so uh, we, we really wanna make sure then with the help of the county to reach each and every resident and customer out there to let them know, we need to know how to reach you, the best way to reach you, whether it's by landline, cell phone, email, text you, whatever. Um, if there were circumstances where we did have to uh, proactively shut out the power and there was a, a, a community center or station set up for people to go to, we want to be able to get that information to them. So um, we really want to work with you all and work with the county staff to make sure that we're able to get that information. Right, and I mean, this is one of the, one of the concerns I have is that many people don't have landlines anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you turn off the power, they no longer have communications. Uh, and I mean, the, one of the, the the concerns, and obviously we we don't want to have fires, but we also need to understand that there's multifaceted. So, if if we turn off the power and we don't have pumps for the wells to have water to fight the fight it, and we don't have communications, so people can't call in grass fires, uh, it's it becomes potentially a much more dangerous and more. Uh, a much more dangerous situation and more likely to have fires that get out of control. And so trying to figure out how that works and so that it's not just mm -hmm. the, the power lines that may be causing fires, but a lot of other factors and that, in fact, cutting the power exacerbates the danger. Um, mm -hmm. we, should be, we should be really clear on, on the potential, on the larger impacts, the macro impacts. Um, and so trying to understand. And then, I, you know, if we come back here next year, by next year will we have these micro grids set up and community centers all identified across all of Santa Cruz Mountains? Or is this, is this a multi-year thing? Is this a six-month effort? Is this a, I don't know what it, I don't know what it takes to create a micro grid uh, or to have a staffed community center uh, ready to go. Uh, in one of these emergencies? So I think it's gonna be an ongoing process. Um, and it, I, I wouldn't say that at this point we're planning to have a, a dedicated PG&E run facility. I mean, that's not part of the plan. The plan is to work with community groups and organizations that already have facilities set up and to help bolster those facilities. So at this point, we, as I mentioned, we've worked with other groups in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, over the years. We'll continue to do that, but also we need to continue talking with them and working with them to help bolster and build up their capacity. So that's something that we will, we're, we're doing right now and we'll continue to do it going forward. So I wouldn't put a timeline on it because I think it's something that will continue to grow and evolve. Um, and that there won't be just a, you know, within a year we'll have it all set or two years we'll have it all set. Uh, as Greg talked about, this is something very new for us, um, something new for this whole territory uh, as far as proactively shutting up the power. The only other place it's been done in the state is in San Diego. And um, so we're, we're learning, we're refining, we're figuring out exactly how this is gonna work. And um, that's part of the reason why we're here to talk with you all, um, to get this kind of feedback and input because you all know your constituents, you know your districts. And um, you know, we, we feel like we know our customers, but we really need this kind of input to help us do this right. 
You know, if I could add to that, I think um, uh, many of these community centers may not require uh, a microgrid. They already have uh, reliable power. It might be just a backup generator or something like that in case that power goes off. So right. it's not a matter of a brand new facility, all microgrid to make that happen. That to me is a possibility, but there's a lot of uh, community centers that we know around in, in our service territory that uh, already are available and we can utilize. It's just really a matter of making sure they have a good, reliable power source. Right. that are out of tier two and are out of tier three areas that people can use or are using today. Right, I mean, that's the other concern I uh, just triggered, the other concern, which is in addition to not having good communications without power and not having access to water without power uh, and obviously the medical issues, but then also if this causes thousands and thousands of generators to be now in our rural areas, uh, how much does that increase the fire danger versus transmission lines. And so I think, um, you know, I, I, I think the goal has to be to reduce the fire danger <coughs> and then everyone <coughs> calibrates their policies, you know, to, to that end versus having one particular entity trying to reduce their contribution to the power to, to fire danger. Uh, and that's that's the concern I have with this policy. And, and uh, we do as well. This is not something that we, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off of risks, right? Um, and we don't take this decision lightly. It's really, really, truly a last resort type effort because you're right. There is, from a public safety perspective, there are trade-offs, and I think that's the challenge uh, we're gonna have to, and that's why we're gonna need your support and partnering with others to how do we build this going forward? How do we make this even at the state level? Because that's the, really the new normal around here and we're just gonna have to figure out collectively how to make it it's at least impactful to, to uh, California residents. I mean, I, yeah, but I guess I'd say I, um, uh, there is a new normal, there is higher risk and, and, uh, and you know, 90% of the things you're talking about here are really good things that will improve public safety. And so, but in terms of the automatic shove, it doesn't feel as though we've all sat down and made those trade-offs. It feels as though, you know, PG&E has decided to reduce its risk and at the, and then everyone else now has to recalibrate what, how, what their potential risks are. And in fact, it could be increasing risk uh, for areas. And that's the, that's the hard part. It doesn't feel like we all sat down allocated risk, figured out the best strategy and came forward because we're being presented with a policy that may increase the risk for other people in, in our rural areas. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I, I guess the first question I have is, when do you expect that this new uh, effort to turn off our power will take place? How soon might uh, um, Santa Cruz County residents expect that that might happen? It, it all depends upon the conditions. So it, it could happen next week. <laughs> I mean, I'm, if, I'm, I'm if, trying to get some sense of If the conditions this. presented themselves so, in a way, yes, it could. Um, so I appreciate that you're here today and I'm thankful to our general services and our CAO's office for, uh, for inviting you to come to speak, but I am uh, somewhat alarmed that you could shut off the, per, the, the power next week and this is the first time we're hearing anything about it. I've talked to my rural uh, residents when I knew this item was gonna be on there and I said, what do you know about this? They didn't know anything about it. Um, I haven't had a chance to call the, uh, the school district, which would probably be the community center um, in the summit area uh, that might be able to serve as that. Um, but I'm sure they don't know anything about it. Uh, so. I, I, it's hard for me to believe that you've been working since March uh, on something which you say is the new normal, but you haven't, the, the public outreach is, is, is terrible. Um, you should be holding community meetings in the rural communities to answer people's questions and help them prepare. Um, you have a responsibility as a public utility to reach out to your ratepayers to engage them in, in, in this activity. Um, and so when we hear th th things like, we will attempt to, to, to reach people, we will do our best, you have my word, it doesn't really mean much. 
uh, uh, to people who are gonna lose their power, don't know how long, uh, don't know how much advance notice they'll get. Um, it's been talked about that the, the life safety uh, issues, uh, the, the, the increased fire dangers, but there's also an economic impact. Um, you know, we have businesses, I have businesses, you know, there's a, the, the Summit store up, a, up in the Summit area, um, it sort of acts like a community center. It's the, it's the main commercial activity, but you turn off the power for 24 hours, the losses are, are, are great. I see a big Greek lumper. I don't know how, how, how much they lose when you turn it off um, uh, for, for, we don't know how long. You know, the, 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 world, the, the rest of the world also operates, um, and your failure to, uh, to communicate effectively with the people you serve um, is alarming. Um, you would have thought that uh, after the debacle that was the, uh, the, the, um, the smart meter rollout, that you would have learned something about, uh, about communicating with the public, about sharing information, about trying to engage them. But I don't see that. I am very concerned as well about uh, your, your um, tree cutting. In your slide, which you d didn't go over very, uh, at, at any great length, that uh, at least what I took from it uh, is we could have a clearing that is now one and a half feet that could be as much as 12 feet, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so where's that gonna happen? What's that gonna impact? Is it gonna be on someone's property? So, you know, it's, it's, um, though communicating that and getting a better sense for, uh, 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 to people is important. And as w we saw with uh, PG&E's efforts to um, uh, cut down trees around the gas line transmission, um, it's, it's sometimes questionable the decisions that the utility makes in terms of, the, of the, uh, being able to access um, the transmission uh, devices. So to hear about 12 feet wide um, uh, uh, cutting of vegetation around lines, that's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm not sure what the, what the environmental review process is that, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I'm concerned uh, about that um, in our rural areas, how many trees you'd be cutting down um, and whether you have to um, go through um, a full environmental review, I'm sure that we will, we will look at that um, and we will make challenges. Uh, if you are not following the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, I think uh, that um, from what I can tell in your presentation is you uh, have tried this in one area, San Diego. Um, I don't know whether you've worked out the kinks there or not. I guarantee I'm gonna talk to my colleagues on the uh, San Diego Board of Supervisors and ask them about the impact that that has had. Um, but it seems to me you need to put a lot more work into something that is a, as drastic as, um, as turning off the power at people's homes, um, as placing them in danger um, uh, under the rubric of this is the new normal and we're trying to protect you. That, you know, that's, that's, um, that may not seem that way to, to, to people who uh, don't have powers for 48 hours uh, because you guessed wrong. Right, so uh, I, I want to challenge you to not enact this this policy until you have done the public outreach necessary to inform rural residents to come up with a good plan about how to protect uh, those communities who will be suffering uh, from your proactive uh, turning off of power. And um, when that is together, then you might be ready. Um, but I, uh, but I, uh, but I don't think you're ready now. I don't think it, it, it's wise uh, to do this. Um, uh, I'm concerned about the effect it will have on our rural residents, and I'm con concerned about what it'll have uh, on, on just the mindless cutting of trees, um, because we're not. I, I can't tell who's going to make a decision whether it's going to be four feet or twelve feet. So I, I think you really need to, to think about um, recalibrating this policy to get it to be normal before you say it's the new normal, because it's not ready. Thank you for the comments. And, and just to clarify, San Diego is a different company. It's San Diego Gas and Electric. All right, so, so you have no experience in doing this. So I, I, I'm just saying that uh, given the paucity of, 
of the outreach that you have, con that you have conducted so far and the fact that the power could go off as soon as next week, you have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. with the, your ratepayers, the people who pay your bills, um, to inform them about how to prepare for this, um, whether it's actually necessary, what will be the impact on, on the vegetation around their homes, and, and uh, what are the backups that can be put in place uh, to when you're gonna turn off the power for as long as 48 hours uh, or longer, that, uh, that they have some assurances that they, can, that they can continue to function, that their businesses can continue to function. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, um, I just want to, I want to say in a more pleasant note, I just want to thank you for the previous actions that you have taken to uh, have these, um, these uh, base stations uh, that you, you put into place years ago when we had some storms and so forth for, to mobilize so they could, you, your, uh, your folks uh, can be closer to the people to serve them as quickly as possible. I mean, it's uh, having them stationed in Scotts Valley and not in Santa Cruz, for instance, helps get them up to uh, Santa Rosa Valley. So I appreciate that. Let's uh, start there. And then uh, I agree with, uh, I have to say, uh, it's nice to have you today, here today and thank you for coming uh, and listening to our concerns. Uh, beca I, because what I'm hearing in my district up in the San Lorenzo Valley, which is that tier three, most of it it looks like, um, they're concerned with just, what, wow, this turnoff of power, you know, the health related issues is what mm -hmm. I'm hearing most and you've heard it also again. I, I wanted to ask, you said there's 13,000 miles of distribution current in tier, tier three, and we have, a, it looks like a lot of it in San Juan's Valley. Do you know how much, how many miles of that is in our county? Uh, not exactly, but okay. we can get that information for you. Okay, and what, it, when you uh, go into the program of, of uh, you know, cutting the trees and so forth, and uh, how, what's the prop, uh, what's the, uh, what, how do you develop the priority list? Is it, uh, I guess, was it tier three first or population density or what is it based on that you, have you gotten there yet to say this is what we're gonna, we're gonna go to tier three first and then? So the, so the new uh, CPUC regulation requires us to do this uh, four foot clearance on either side in the tier three areas. Okay. So that's where we're gonna be, uh, that's where we're gonna be focusing first. Okay. And then, uh, you know, we're talking weather conditions, but here in uh, Santa Cruz County Territory, we have earthquake concerns too that could probably develop uh, uh, or result in the same kind of a shutdown effort. I know we're looking at the wildfires and they're going on today uh, and in the northern part of the state again, unfortunately. But, um, you know, that, you know, it probably ought to be, uh, could you have the same kind of a, a concern or, or shutdown if an earthquake hit and poles started to fall or whatever the case may be? I mean, probably for an area like ours, uh, the mention of uh, earthquake, a response to a severe earthquake like we had in uh, 89 would be a good thing to just add on. This is um, something that, you know, earth, uh, earthquake territory, uh, some people would like to know that as well, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you. I want to thank you for your report. And I, I have noticed in the past, uh, uh, PG&E uh, is part of that uh, emergency response uh, center at the sher new sheriff station. And uh, you're, you're actually at the center of uh, public safety in a lot of cases. Everybody has to wait for your response and how you guys do your job. And I wanna commend everybody uh, that everything they've done in the past. Uh, you're working under terrible conditions and you're also uh, have to look out for the safety of your workers, the, the ones that have to respond in the middle of the storm. So uh, I guess when it comes down to priorities, uh, <coughs> Uh, you said that you don't take it lightly of turning off the power or even proactive, uh, proactively turning off the power. <clears throat> uh, when you're weighing the benefit and the burden, uh, what, what is the biggest part of the, uh, the benefit? Is that uh, the potential of these wires that are that they're breaking and they're sending off electricity or, or what, what is it that gives so much weight to uh, 
a proactive decision? It, it really boils down to uh, what's happening at the time in the field. That's why we send out our troublemen and first responders to uh, take a look at seeing the conditions. And the, primarily, the primary risk is things blowing into our lines. It could be uh, bark from trees, it could be tree branches, it could be a tree that's way outside of the right of way that's ready to fall in. Uh, it can be a tarp from someone's home that uh, that is. So it's really the, the, we put eyes on the ground to see really what's going on. If we have a lot of stuff that's going into our lines and a lot of activity in that regard, then we would probably move forward with, with proactively shutting the lines down because it's just a matter of time before something happens. Right. So it's right. not a, we don't do it from a central location uh, and use it that way. We really want to make sure we're, uh, we have, the risks are there before we would do something like that. So you don't do it from a central location, so it's more of a neighborhood type of uh, proactive decision? Correct, we, we put people, we put some of our, we will have our trouble men, we'll have other pg e people go out into the field and look at the conditions of what's going on in that particular area before we would shut anything off. And how many people does that affect uh, when you're talking about a particular uh, area? Uh, for example, uh, one line is sparking, uh, and it could be actually triggered by uh, uh, these uh, kind of balloons. That, that yeah, mylar are, balloons, right. yeah, they've, they've created I, problems. I saw one one time that got hooked up on yeah. uh, one of the neighborhood lines. Yeah. It's kind of amazing how many sparks it'll put off. Yes. Okay, so when it's you It's stuff respond, like that, that blow into the lines. Sure. When you respond to that, you don't shut off uh, uh, you know, w uh, a half mile radius of that one particular line. You shut off just that line or you shut yes. off? And that line probably affects how many people? It varies, it really depends on whether it's a, just a tap line and we have a switch that just affects a, a small neighborhood or it might be a whole feeder that comes out of a substation. What would be in the high and low on that? Uh, it really varies across, uh, across the state. It's really hard to say. It could be anywhere from you know, 10, 20 people up to several hundred people, okay. depending again how, how long the line is and how far it travels. Yeah, and the, the other, I do want to commend you uh, when, when there is an emergency and how important you are to the, uh, the public. I've noticed uh, sheriffs have to wait for you. Uh, fire department really has to wait sometimes. Uh, the National Guard, that's part of that also, uh, in a big emergency like an earthquake or a big fire. And uh, public works, I mean, everybody's working together. Uh, when, when you're making a decision out there, are you talking and listening to the sheriffs and everybody on what their opinion is? Because if they have to wait for you, uh, there's got to be communications, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, we, we not only communicate with the fire departments, but also sheriffs and everybody. We have a, we have a very good uh, partnership with many of those agencies across the state. Um, and we're w all working together from a standpoint of preparing for uh, any, any kind of emergency response, whether it's wildfire, uh, earthquakes, um, uh, storms, bad storms that come in. We're all communicating and coordinating uh, together. Right. And uh, I guess the big one is always in the winter with the uh, storm uh, flooding. And the big storm uh, we had, of course, about a year and five months ago. So um, I, I want to I want to thank your PG&E crew for uh, putting their life in uh, danger, actually, to uh, respond to a lot of this. And uh, um, um, that's basically it. Thank you, Supervisor Capa. We'll now open it up for the community to address us on this item. Any members of the community are welcome to address us. Good morning, Mr. Balaj. Thank you for, well, for waiting. Uh, thank you, Bob Balaj, Big Creek Lumber Company. Uh, I want to preface what I'm about to say uh, by say, stating that our company and myself completely understand the dilemma that PG&E is in. I've lived in the rural area and many times they've come out to restore power and greatly appreciate it. Uh, I do concur with comments that were made here. And, 
uh, particularly by Supervisor Leopold, that, you know, th we found out about this a day and a half ago, and it's a daytime, there aren't very many people here, uh, people are working. I, I, I mean, I have the luxury of being paid by my company to show up for these things, most people don't. And so I would strongly underscore the necessity of going out into rural areas and probably meeting people in having meetings in the evening when working people can attend. Uh, other thing I wanna say, um, it sounds to me like you're gonna be using uh, criteria, weather criteria that you're monitoring as opposed to CAL FIRE, a company monitors a CAL FIRE uh, weather reports all the time for obvious reasons. But if it would be wise for PG&E to specify what the criteria you're going to use is going to be and for the public to be able to have access to that information in real time so we know what to expect. I mean, I'm also deeply concerned about this could happen tomorrow. Uh, Supervisor Leopold is correct. We have 100 employees that live on the end of a power line and their livelihoods depend on uh, that power because our sawmill primarily runs on electricity. So, you know, that that's a internal selfish concern, but it's a very real concern with real people involved and their livelihoods. Um, and lastly, on that issue, that map that you showed that showed tier three and, and tier two, I think that needs to be adjusted because what if a power line goes through a tier three into a tier two? That tier three area that's gonna be shut down really needs to show those areas because realistically with respect to shutdown, those aren't tier two areas, they're tier three areas, and that includes along the coast of, of uh, the, the north coast of the county, which I think some, if not all of the power has to go through tier three to get to tier two. So um, we need more accurate information, and, and again, appreciate you folks being here, but I agree completely with the comments that the supervisors have made, I, I think, the lack of information, that th this is premature, you need so considerably more outreach and more information to the public. Thank you, Mr. Thanks Cross. for being here. Does anybody else like to address us? Please feel free to line up, that'd be great. Good morning, thank you for waiting. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the power. Uh, my name is Larry Lopp. I live in, the, I just found out a few days ago, in a tier three extreme fire th threat area. I've lived there for 42 years. We know it's an extreme threat area. Also, we have no trouble communicating with PG&E when the lines go down, the power goes off. The problem is when will they come back so we can get back to our life? And the most terrifying thing I just heard is, okay, we're gonna shut them off and then take two days to figure out whether we can bring them back up. That's just ridiculous. You're gonna have to figure out how to use technology. Now, let me point out, there's, there's a, a few myths here that this is uh, the new normal. Okay, here's Jerry Brown in the State of the Union, or the State of the State. California's fire season has increased 78 days over the last 40 years. How much warning do you need? Global warming has been known for 30 years. How much more warning do you need? The second thing is, you've already been found uh, as the source of the ignition for the fires up north. Now that shouldn't be a surprise. Okay. But I listened today and I heard nothing about how you're gonna control your power lines so they don't become igniters of forest fires, except take some of the switches off manual and not turn them back on until you're sure you're not just feeding us short. I, I mean, that's, that's just not reasonable. It isn't. Now, I'm not gonna get involved in this whole question of, uh, is that a minute? Okay. 
in this whole question of who should do what, but I do want to point out to you that you have a fiduciary responsibility to deal with your violation of ignition. You need to deal with that first. Now, as far as four feet, 12 feet, it's a big deal. I just had my power lines, they came up and sent me this really nice note. You ha we have to clear those, and what they did is they took the top third of the tree off, they chipped the branches, and they took all the trunks and dumped them and left. Now that's your policy in the mountains right now. You put a donut hole that disappears within two or three years around the power lines. You do almost nothing along the runs. You do nothing underneath. Now, I don't think that's your problem. It's partly your problem, but that belongs to the state, it belongs to the county, it belongs to Cal Fire. Until though, and the environmental review people, until you get that straightened out. Thank you. The only thing you can do. Thank you is fix your problem, thank the ignition. You. Morning, Mr. Collins, thank you for waiting. Good morning, uh, I'm down here this morning to uh, point out that there's, uh, the underlying issue here is that we have downed arcing conductors. In other words, these power lines break, they fall to earth, and they start arc flashing because there is no protection in PG&E circuit to prevent that current from continuing to flow. These, these uh, the voltages in the earth are only, are, are substantially, the voltages are the same, but the amperages are low, so the fuses do not function. Now, there's, there have been 30 years of discussion among electrical engineers about this problem and how to deal with it. It has been solved. San Diego Gas and Electric has begun installing arc, arc fault interruption protection on its circuits. What that means is that they have equipment that can sense when a conductor parts and shut that circuit off before that conductor even touches earth. There is another way of doing this, and this is put to extend a grounding bar out beyond the, the, the uh, power pole so that when the conductor breaks, it makes contact with that grounded conductor and burns out these primitive fuses that PG&E uses on its poles. The problem is an infrastructure problem. Uh, the fires in, uh, uh, Sonoma and uh, Napa County a year and a half ago, they were, according to CDF, caused by arcing conductors on the ground and reclosing, reclosure devices that kept reclosing and sending bursts of electricity into down conductors. So I just re really want to emphasize that this is a problem that has had a solution for some time now. It's a technical solution and it would do away with the rest of this issue. The reason that power has to be turned off is because PG&E's equipment is not capable of sensing arc faults in its lines. We had all this blah, blah, blah about, you know, smart meters and all the advancement. Apparently there's been no advancement in safety that I've seen as a result of the installation of all those meters and the relays and so forth. So if anybody thinks that Davy Tree is gonna come on to my beautiful private road lined with centuries old trees and cut a 12 foot wide swath under their crummy little quarter inch splice filled copper conductors that some of which are 40, 50 years old, they're dreaming. And the rest of the people that find out about this are gonna be raising hell too. So thank you for your attention and please understand I'm researching this issue. I'm gonna submit a document to the county and to the PUC about it, thank you very much. There is a solution and it is not shutting power off to everybody and just demolishing the landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Anybody else like to address this? Good morning, Ms. Steinbrenner, thank you for waiting on this item. Good morning, thank you. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos, also a member of CERT, Aries, and the Santa Cruz Fire Safe Council. I have a lot of concerns about this too, and um, Mr. Foster, I know you are on the board of directors for Aptos La Salva Fire District, so I would think that you'd be paying better attention to this public outreach part, but, um, I want to commend you for the idea of putting tree wire up that happened in my neighborhood and it did uh, reduce the number of outages, but why is PG&E not looking into the issues that Mr. Collins just presented and or putting the wires underground? 
this is the new normal, you say, so why not invest these billions of dollars that you're talking about with this that will put the community at risk um, and, and put that money into putting the power wires underground? not having to remove the trees. The roadways are already there with your easement. Put the power wires underground. How will this affect uh, insurance rates of rural residents, knowing that their power may go off and they may have no water to fight fires in the rural areas? and they will have no communication devices in many areas to call 911 if there are spot fires. What is the CEQA process that you're following? I'm not hearing anything about that, and thank you, Chairman, uh, Supervisor Leopold, for bringing that up. Are you working with AT&T to um, work out the glitch that many people in the rural area have when power goes off, they have no phone service. In my area, AT&T comes out within 24 hours of big storms, and they put in generators at the poles. How does that work for you? Um, what about the elderly who in the, Napa fire, in the Sonoma fires burned in their garages because they couldn't physically lift their garage doors when the power went out? What about the heritage trees? What about the erosion that all of this tree cutting, clear cutting would bring? What about all in the summertime when red flag conditions come, what about all our summer visitors that are not registered with you but are in the Airbnb and vacation rentals? How would they be notified? What about these microgrid centers? Are you working with Red Cross? Are you working with the emergency response people? Are you working with Rosemary Anderson? Are you working f um, with the communications efforts in the county for, emer for uh, emergency response? response, and what about an evacuation plan? How would that happen? There are so many questions here, and I want to thank Supervisor Leopold for bringing them bluntly to your attention, because I live in the rural area, and I didn't know about this until I looked through the Board of Supervisors agenda and saw that you were going to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to address us on this item? This will be your final opportunity, so anybody else? Good morning, welcome, thanks for waiting. Hi, I'm Loretta Marino. I'm a little late to the party, so um, I just wanted to um, make a comment in general about what I've heard about pg e and this uh, power line clearance throughout the state. I heard it's tier three, about 7,000 miles of power line. Maybe it's more, I think I heard maybe more. And I just would like to comment that I really do hope you seriously look at, while you may be exempt from CEQA perhaps, um, that's perhaps why we haven't heard about it, um, that you seriously look at um, the nuances of uh, wildlife habitat across the state and the fact that a broad brush stroke does not necessarily or should not necessarily apply. I understand you have liability issues, but I am very concerned with a broad brush stroke to address clearance issues statewide and um, you have endangered species, very sensitive habitat. So in terms of public outreach, talking about how you're gonna mitigate as you go, um, it's not just that 12 feet each side, it's also the heavy equipment getting into these areas, sometimes remote, not right on a roadway. So if you guys could talk more about that proactively, I think the public would like to know. So thank you. Thank you, anybody else? We should have government of for and by the people not of, for, and by corporations like PG&E that have, they're like dictating to us. And quite the history of PG&E, going back to the San Francisco earthquake fires of 1904, those were PG&E gas lines. Uh, PG&E is not in the business of safety. They are not in the business of safety. They are in the business of profit for their stockholders. Um, the history of uh, some of the PG&E damage, um, I'm just gonna read a, a, a list here, a brief list. San Bruno Fire, 2010, Smart Meters, I'll give you this. Injuries and fatalities have resulted from your smart meter fires. 
they've been recalled in some areas. Some of them exploded in 2010 here in Capitola. People died. These are dangerous meters. They catch fire. They're installed on utility poles with this distributed antenna system. Um, uh, so it seems like your comments, Supervisor Coonerty, about the situation being made worse by PG&E's plans to cut off power. Um, I think that's well substantiated what PG&E has done endangers the public. Also in 2007, there was a huge fire in Malibu. I'll give you copies of this. Uh, when power lines, um, this was Southern California Edison, but it um, applies here. Um, the fire sparked a probe into why Southern California Edison, quoting from the newspaper there, is allowing various wireless communication companies to add heavy wind catching cables and antennas to wooden electric uh, poles without calculating possible collapse risk. All around here are overloaded power lines with wireless facilities, potential fire for that. And the mayor of Malibu said, then you are telling us these are time bombs waiting to go off and start you, these fires. Um, Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Not a good plan. Thank you. Is we there, say no. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on this item? This, is there anybody else beyond this speaker? This will be the final speaker on this item. Yeah, I was able to hear the presentation. I wanted to tell you guys thank you. Uh, I would say that the, it, it seems very dubious in terms of taking a proactive strategy in trying to ameliorate the, um, you know, the popping. I've been out there in Scotts Valley, and since I've been there, they've had about, I don't know, about five blackouts down, down off Mount Hermon and the road. I, I, and, I, and I have seen visually those things pop and just sparkle with all kinds of it, and it sounds like a big bomb. And I would say is that, you know, you need to get more public input. There needs to be more outreach so that you can hear the concerns of the citizens. And, you know, with record profits, I think the American public deserves that. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, 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 I would like, um, well, I would like pg &E to to seriously engage in uh, real public outreach um, I know in my district, uh, I would assume that in all of our, our rural residents, they deserve uh, to uh, hear directly from you, and you, you, you should hear directly from your ratepayers uh, uh, about this. Um, I can't make you do that by, uh, uh, by motion here, but uh, I think you should take this away from here, that you should really step up your uh, public outreach efforts um, in order to make that happen. I would like to move uh, that we write to both PG&E and the PUC about our concerns that were uh, that we identified here about our concerns. Um, uh, uh, this is, is an inclusive list, but our concerns about uh, uh, outreach, our concerns about our effects on other safety uh, elements, our concerns about the economic impact, our concerns about the life-threatening um, uh, or people who rely on on uh, life-saving devices. Uh, I would also uh, direct. Um, uh, our county council to review the, this policy to find out whether um, they're adhering to both our code and, uh, and CEQA and come back with recommendations and any other departments that, uh, that uh, might take a look at this and uh, make recommendations. Motion from Supervisor Leopold, second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in uh, Just a quick. Uh, brief, so okay. brief, because this item's gone on quite some time. I'll Supervisor do it quickly. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, you are the center of uh, uh, response during an emergency. And I think uh, what we have here is uh, like that old movie, uh, we have a problem in communications. Uh, your uh, <coughs> public relations department uh, really is uh, uh, lacking. And not only talking to the ratepayer, my question is, when you make your decisions, did you talk to all the other people 
that are responsible re to uh, when it comes to response in an emergency, and that would be like the sheriff's department, police departments with the cities, uh, fire, uh, the Cal Fire, fire departments, public works. Uh, we can go on and on. Uh, before you made this decision, did that take place? And uh, of course, it didn't take place with the ratepayers, but I'm wondering if uh, there's maybe a big problem of communications between PG&E and all the other people involved in public safety. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if, the, if you can respond, just make it very brief, Mr. Foster, if that's okay, that, um, if you had a brief comment back. Yeah, I'm just gonna say, as we've said, we have been coordinating with, with different agencies across the state and locally and trying to ensure that they know that they know what um, what we're planning on, what we're talking about doing, and what we're developing. Um, we'll continue to do that. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you for coming uh, to meet with us. I've been assured by Public Works that this is a very fast item, so we will have you present this item, then the board will take a five-minute break to get to our, our 1045 scheduled public hearing before we move back to item 86, 86 one, 86 two. This is item 85, which is to consider Measure D, five-year plan for the 18-19 fiscal year and take related actions. As outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO, Director of Public Works, we have the attached Measure D, five-year plan. Mr. Wiesner, are you presenting this? I am. Uh, Thank you for waiting. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, members of the board, CAO, members of the public. Uh, Steve Wiesner here with the Department of Public Works. I have a very brief presentation for the annual Measure D five-year plan update. Um, it's a, I'm just gonna go over uh, a little bit about Measure D. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the first year project, a little bit about our pavement management system, and then the recommendations that are before you today. Um, as you're aware, our county passed a half-cent sales tax measure. Um, uh, countywide sales tax measure in November 2016. It's 30-year funding source for transportation projects countywide. Um, it's uh, annual revenues estimated around 17 million, and of that, the county road system gets uh, an estimated 2.6 million dollars a year. Um, there's some annual requirements in the ordinance, uh, which include producing a five-year plan that's approved in a public hearing by your board, um, which is why we're here today. Uh, the, uh, we did a, a survey um, of our community then in the unincorporated areas of our county last year before our first plan was created. And the top three priorities for our community was uh, maintenance and repair of county roadways, uh, neighborhood resurfacing projects, and neighborhood safety projects. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just go over the project that's gonna be out to construction this summer. Um, it's uh, actively being worked on now. I think the next month you're gonna see a lot of activity countywide. Um, in District 1, uh, we're doing some work on Miller Hill and Miller Cutoff Roads in the rural area, middle part of our county. Um, we need to rebuild some areas of the road, and then we're going to go ahead and, and, and seal it up. In District 2, in the La Selva Beach area, mid area of our county, um, we're doing a lot of work in the neighborhood down there, uh, doing some base repairs, and uh, we'll seal up those roads as well. In District 3, this is in the Bonnie Dune area of our county. Um, we're gonna be doing work on Martin Road, um, a portion of Martin Road. Um, again, isolated base repairs, and then we'll, be, we'll go ahead and seal that up as well. Uh, now in District 4, uh, this is a project that was completed this past fiscal year, and this was the much needed replacement of the Casser Lee Road Bridge there near Smith Road. Um, and that project is complete, and that was uh, the share, the District 4 share of Measure D funds went to that project. And lastly, in District 5, um, we're gonna be working in downtown Boulder Creek and resurfacing some roads uh, in that area uh, where, that are in much need of, of some resurfacing work. A very similar type of work, we'll be doing some dig outs, some isolated base repairs, a little bit of reconstruction, then we'll seal up the whole neighborhood. Okay, just to uh, just touch a little bit on our pavement management system, there'll be more to come this year on that, um, but this is how we choose the roads. Uh, it helps inform us on which roads are needed uh, to be repaired. Um, the county does maintain a, a database-driven pavement management system. Um, it's a software package. The database includes uh, a, a score of pavement health, which is known as our pavement condition in index. Uh, you've heard us talk about this, the PCI, and this is, we end up with a pavement condition index of, of our whole county road system, but also of individual road segments throughout the county. It's a tool that we use to maximize our limited resources. Um, that come in and it helps us uh, vet through and decide you know, which, which roads are up and ready to be uh, worked on. 
uh, depending upon the type of resources we have available. And we're actually currently in the process of updating our pavement management system. We have a consulting firm working on this. We're doing a countywide survey that'll give us a new baseline. We do this about once every five years. And we plan to return to your board uh, with the sort of a state of the pavement update that'll include the pavement management system update. And it'll also talk a little bit more about our available resources and how, how we recommend to use those and moving forward. Um, so therefore the fifth year plan of this plan um, is, 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 is being recommended to be put into reserves until we come back to your board with the pavement management update. Once that's complete, we'll have a better idea of exactly which roads to recommend. Okay, just to remind you, um, this, this thing we talk about, which is our pavement condition index, and this is really a scale from zero to, to 100, and as you can see in the lower right there, that's a, a road that's basically completely failed. Um, that gets a zero, and then a brand new road uh, would be 100, and, and everything in between. Okay, so the recommended actions that are before you today are to adopt the attached uh, Measure D five-year plan for the 18-19 fiscal year. Authorize our department to submit a copy of this approved package to the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. So that's my very brief update, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's perfect, thank you, Mr. Yep. Wiesner, and, and thank you for the great work your department. It goes to show that when we do have funding, the uh, amazing things that your department can do. Are there any supervisors with comments on this item? Supervisor Caput. You bet, yeah. <clears throat> I know you're working under tough situations and, all, and everything. Um, now, what I saw for District 4, uh, this is just a one-year uh, projection here. Is that so, correct? So what it is is actually it's the same exact plan that we gave you last year, and it, it, so it's four years, and the fifth year we plan to put in reserves. What you saw in District 4 is what we really want to do is that uh, the local end of Green Valley Road, and it's going to take a couple years of building a bank to do that, and that's our recommendation for District 4. Okay, so, what about Hazeldale Road? So. Uh, Hazeldale Road's not in the program right now. Um, that has a lot of storm damage that we're working on um, trying to get repaired as well right now. Okay, that, yeah. that funding will come from where? For the Hazeldale Road? For the storm damage repair? Yeah. Uh, that's actually the Federal Highway Administration which is helping us fund that road. It's a federal aid route and what we're recommending for Measure D is to, is to work on local roads and rural roads which we really have been short on, on funding in the last many years. Right, so uh, Hazeldale comes under uh, federal and uh, state. Correct, and it would, it would um, qualify for federal aid money. And that also includes uh, Houlihan Road, uh, intersection of 152 and college. Correct, those are also federal aid routes. Okay, yeah. I guess the only concern I have, I don't want to see the Casserly Bridge used as a reason uh, why maybe for the next two, three years uh, we're not getting, uh, you know, enough money for South County. No, absolutely not. We just used the first year of Measure D for your district on the Casserly Road Bridge, and we will continue to work on and recommend pavement management projects in your district. And then, uh, will, will I share that with uh, District 2, uh, Hazel Del Road and all that? Also, we share uh, Apple, what is that, Apple Valley? Wash up, uh, if you look there on... Uh, Apple Valley Road at Wheelock, uh, that would be District 2 and District 4. I notice on both of them. Uh, money is allocated to both of them, but uh, is that the same allocation, 50-50 for each one, uh, each side of the, each district? So uh, what you're looking at is Green Valley Road. The limits are between Wheelock and Apple Valley, so the work is actually taking place on Green Valley Road. Um, I think that you're looking at the limits. It's and if actually you, a washed out bridge. Uh, we can take a look at that for you. I don't have information on that right now. Is that you're interested in Apple Valley Road? Okay. Okay, we, we'd yeah. be happy and to provide Like I said, it's, uh, the district line goes right through the middle of it. <coughs> Are any of the supervisors before we open this up for public comment? Just three things. Thank the voters for passing Measure D. More than uh, two-thirds of them appreciate the work of Public Works in getting to and prioritizing the most, most significant road problems. And for the others, everybody's got, there's problem, road problems throughout this county, but please have patience. We're going to get to it as quick, quickly as we can. Anybody from the community like to address us on the Measure D list? Please feel free to step forward. 
Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. Um, I would like, uh, and I'm sorry I stepped back to close the doors to eliminate the noise, so I, I missed part of your presentation, but I would like um, a discussion about the criteria that Public Works is using to assign the prioritization for these um, projects within different districts. Are you using um, uh, property values? Are you using economic impacts of deteriorating roadways? Uh, taking into account there are more and more commercial um, licenses being given for rural areas, for wineries and such, that more public is going out in this for economic reasons? Are you considering, um, are you doing traffic counts on any of these areas and considering the populations and those with limited ingress, egress, so that it is their only emergency access route? And are you uh, talking with the emergency responders? They know the condition of the road and which ones most impact them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. This is an action okay. item. I'll move the recommended action. Uh, with, uh, you know, perhaps Ms. Steinbrenner can talk to Public Works staff about the process. A motion from Coonerty and a second from McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. So we will break uh, just for 10 minutes until 11 o'clock. We have a 1045 scheduled item that we're running late on, so if we could definitely come back at 11 o'clock. The board will recess till then. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, after our short recess, we're now going to take our 1045 scheduled item, which is a public, which is item 87, a public hearing to consider designating the Silver Ranch Barn in Aptos, which is APN uh, 107-36109, as a resource of local historic significance, and adding the barn to the Santa Cruz County Inventory of Historic Resources, as outlined in the memo of the Planning Director. Ms. Murphy, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, Supervisors. Recognizing the value that historic buildings add to our cultural life, maintaining the connection with our past, and adding to the architectural character and uniqueness of the community, Santa Cruz County maintains an inventory of historic resources which have been designated by the Board of Supervisors and provides regulations to protect these resources. Owners Carol and Phil Reeder have applied to add the 115-year-old Silver Ranch Barn to the county inventory in order to ensure its preservation for future generations. On April 18th, the Historic Resources Commission held a public hearing and recommended that your board approve the designation. The property owners and members of the public also spoke in support of the application. To be designated as a historic resource in the county, a property is required to have retained its architectural integrity and historic value and to meet one or more designation criteria. As outlined in the Department of Parks and Recreation form, or DPR form, provided by architectural historian Fallon Steffen, the barn is in excellent condition with an ongoing maintenance and repairs since its construction date. The barn retains its original form and materials, including the original redwood siding, door openings, the gable roof form, and the barn hardware. Minor alterations have been made over time to the barn to support its ongoing agricultural use. The barn also retains its historic integrity as it is still in its original setting and location on the Silver Ranch and has been in continuous agricultural use since its construction. The barn retains its association with the apple industry as apples are grown on site and sold to local cider producers. In addition, <clears throat> the barn is historically significant due to its association with the local theme of agriculture, uh, specifically the apple industry, which was important to the development of the county and to the Pleasant Valley region. The barn is still owned by the Silva family, the original owners. Uh, these photos show several generations of the Silva family on the ranch. Taking action to designate the barn is categorically exempt under CEQA as an action by the county to protect the environment. To conclude, the application to designate the Silver Ranch Barn as a resource of local historic significance, or an NR5 resource, 
meets the required designation criteria and findings, and is consistent with general plan policies protecting historic resources. Taking action to designate this barn will help to preserve a rare local example of a 115-year-old barn still in its agricultural use and in its original setting and location. Therefore, it is recommended that your board open the public hearing, adopt the CEQA notice of exemption, and adopt the resolution to amend the county historic resources inventory to include the Silver Ranch Barn with the attached DPR form as an NR5 resource. Thank you. Thank you, it's wonderful to have a positive story at a time of not always other positive things. Uh, great appreciation to county staff and even greater appreciation to the family, uh, the property owners for your willingness to uh, do exactly this and, and actually for all that you've done for agriculture in our community, it's quite remarkable. Is there anybody from the board that would like to address this item before we open it up to public hearing? Okay, we'll open up now the public hearing. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on this item. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos, and I am so heartened that a property owner has taken the time and the expense to preserve something, a treasure like this that really highlights and preserves the working class history of our county that was the foundation and, and hopefully will remain a part of a foundation of our county's um, history and working everyday life. I would like to ask the board to consider uh, giving this property owner some sort of property tax relief under perhaps a Mills Act or some sort of thing to encourage, to reward them for, for caring and taking the time and expense to do this and to encourage other property owners to do the same. All too often, and I have spoken to you before, all too often it's a simple knockdown destruction, demolition, that people choose to do out of economic convenience. But th these people have done clearly the right thing that will preserve this for future generations. And we as a community need to do what we can to encourage similar good, clear-hearted action. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address this in the public hearing? Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. I'm Carell Reeder, and my husband and I are the owners of the barn. Um, I'm a Silva. Four generations back, this barn was my great, great grandfather's barn. And we're so pleased that. Um, we have the opportunity to bring it before you today for your consideration. And I just, I wanna thank the county staff for all their help and support and the um, Resources Commission, the Historical Resources Commission for their support as well. Um, we own the barn, but in a different way, we look at it as a community resource. And that's probably what prompted us to move forward with this. Um, so many, as Becky was saying, so many of these buildings are just bulldozed. They're gone. And they, t they each tell a story of a family, of an industry, of a community. And um, we kind of see this as our legacy, but something that we want to share as long as we're here. Um, and then the long range plan, because we don't have children of our own, our long range plan is to um, leave that ranch maybe to Cal Poly University and have it endure, and hopefully they'll keep the barn, um, but have it endure as a learning center for young people going into agriculture. And so that was another kind of impetus for us stepping forward and saying, let's put some protection on the barn because not everybody may appreciate that history like we do. So thank you for your time today, and thank you, staff. Thank, thank you, you very much, and being a Cal Poly grad, let me know if I can help. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. The Cal Poly Hall of Fame, Supervisor McPherson. I also wanna thank the Silva family. It's so important saving these historic monuments in a way um, that are just disappearing so fast. Um, just a wonderful thing to do, and I wondered, I live in Aptos, but I'm not sure the address of where this is and the cross street, could you say that? And then I'll sit down and just again, thank you very much. 
Thank you. Anybody else on the public hearing? Okay, we'll now close the public hearing. We will bring it back to the board for action. Move approval with our thanks to the family for preserving this really <coughs> wonderful historic spot in our county. A motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Leopold. I'll, I'll just add my uh, note of thanks uh, to the family uh, for being part of Santa Cruz County for such a long time and for seeing this valuable uh, uh, historic resource uh, preserved for uh, future generations. We appreciate that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you all for your work on that. Uh, we'll move back to item 86 which is to consider a report regarding the conducting of Board of Supervisors meetings to approve revisions to the policy and procedures manual and authorize staff on the CAO's off the CA County Administrator's Office to make additional recommended changes to the policies and procedures at the conclusion of any additional board directions as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the Rosenberg's Rule of Order. We have the Board of Supervisors meeting policy and procedures and a clean copy and strikeout underlying copy. Ms. Serena, thank you Good for morning, waiting. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. In January, a subcommittee was formed to examine the procedures regarding Board of Supervisors meetings and come up with recommendations to increase public participation and the efficacy of board meetings. The subcommittee included Supervisors McPherson and Coonerty, working with members of the staff from the County Council, Clerk of the Board, and CAO offices. Research was done for information on best practices in other jurisdictions, both cities and counties. The recommendations before you today include the following. Moving from the Sturgis Standard Code of Parliamentary Procedure to Rosenberg's Rules of Order to simplify parliamentary procedures and have them be more understandable to the public. Having board members pull consent items, which would result in the public needing to ask a board member to pull an item. The hope is that a conversation could occur prior to a board meeting to answer questions, resulting in less need to pull consent items. The public could still comment on consent items during the public comment period. Which brings us to ideas for increasing public participation. In our discussion with other jurisdictions, having a specified time when the public could come to comment, whether it be on items on the consent or regular agenda or items not on the agenda, tended to increase public participation. In addition, attending to the regular board business before consent items were considered also was a way to increase public participation as the public did not have to wait through other agenda considerations to participate in public hearings or other matters before the board as regular business. Your report includes a proposed reordering of the schedule to conduct regular business first with a time certain item of 10 o'clock a.m. or thereafter for all public comment. In addition, the staff is recommending several updates to the policies and procedures for board meetings, which are also <coughs> included in your report. These changes primarily recognize the new uses of technology in our procedures. If your board approves the previously mentioned recommendations, they would then be added as additional changes to the updated procedures in the report. We therefore ask you to accept and file this report, approve the policies and procedures changes, Authorize the staff to make any additional changes to the policy and procedures based on actions taken today. Implement the suggested changes at the August, 17th, August 7th board meeting and report back at next year's budget hearings on these changes. Thank you. There are comments from board members before we open up the community. <coughs> Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate the work of uh, this subcommittee and most of these suggestions I'm supportive of. Uh, in talking with previous uh, or former supervisors, that was the practice in the past that, um, uh, that members of the public had to ask board members uh, for their support in order to pull something off and that encouraged communication. Uh, so uh, I, I support that. Um, the change to Robert's rules, uh, Rosenberg's rules, uh, I think is also uh, a good idea and the idea of putting oral communication to consent item communication together I also uh, think that that makes sense. Um, uh, I, the, the one area where uh, I feel uh, less of a need to make the change is to change the time in which we uh, receive com comments from the public. Um, I, uh, uh, I get that, that there's a, some thought that this increases participation. I, I think um, the one thing that, it, that is always time certain is the beginning of the meeting and everything after that is 
a little loose. Um, so if we want to make it easy for people to, to, to participate, having a, a real-time CERTA makes sense to me and putting it later in the day um, when we say 10 o'clock or thereafter, um, it'll, it'll roll uh, quite a bit. And so um, I would support all the other things, but I don't increase this change in the, in the calendar. Supervisor Coonerty, did you have comments? Sure, I just, um, first of all, thank you for your work in looking at ways to make our meetings more accessible uh, and to get more participation. Uh, it was sort of uh, hinted at, but one of the things that I think would really benefit is when we were, when I was on the city council, uh, people could email in instead of having to come to the meeting and those emails were distributed uh, to, the to the board as during the meeting. Uh, that that email address was advertised on community television, um, and I think that would be a really valuable way for people to be able to participate, um, and I look forward to that coming to us in the future. I guess uh, the, it's all, it's all a matter of trade-offs. My, uh, to, to the question about the consent agenda and public uh, and oral communications being the first thing up, um, in general, the regular agenda item should be the thing that the public more wants to participate in, and it's actually on the agenda, whereas public participation is, uh, or oral communications is uh, about specifically about things that are not on the agenda that aren't the business of the board that particular day. So it's an attempt to um, get, get that particular item to give people certainty so they could come in and participate. Um, so that's, that, that was the thinking behind it, but um, that was the, that's the goal. Supervisor Caput. You bet. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're changing from Sturgis to uh, uh, Rosencrantz, right? Uh, that's, that's a proposal. Rosenberg's? Rosenberg, I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, what I'm getting at here is uh, we've been doing things uh, for about 30 years, am I correct, uh, with the uh, uh, Sturgis uh, Rules of Order? Um, we think that's correct. Um, I'm not Pretty sure about right. the exact date. Yeah. And what I'm getting at is here, how much public comment have we got on, uh, on this and how much have we really talked and reached out as far as making this change? I, I'm not necessarily against it. What I'm getting at is uh, this is a significant change. Uh, I, I did uh, propose uh, Rosenberg's uh, rules of order for the RTC uh, before they had no rules of order at all. And then uh, we were arguing back and forth on whether it would be Roberts, it would be Sturgis, or it would be uh, Rosenberg. We ended up going with Rosenberg. I have no problem with that. But do we, are we really making it, uh, what I noticed in there, it, it needs one of the board members to okay someone from the public to pull an item uh, for discussion. Am I correct? So, so the, these are, you're conflating two things. The, the, the change in, in the rules of order is just a simplification. Uh, Sturgis is a very uh, complex and long book, actually, as is Roberts. This is about a five or seven page, as you probably saw, very simplified rules of order of dictates how it is that the meetings shall be conducted, outlines how the chair will run meetings and makes it very easy for the community to understand how the chair will do it. The other element is a policy and procedures of process that governs things such as consent items. That's totally separate from the rules of order. Uh, and yes, as proposed, there's a number of changes to the policies and procedures, such as um, how consent items will be pulled, uh, increasing, as Supervisor Coonerty mentioned, the ability for people to communicate live or real time with the board during an item that aren't present for people that are watching it at home, for example, in live stream. Uh, and that's what's outlined in a separate policy and procedure component. Yeah, and what I'm getting at is we're kind of deciding what's best for the public without really not getting much uh, public input on this. So I, I think uh, that's the only, uh, it seems like we put this on and it's uh, gonna be decided. I'd, I'd like to see it decided in uh, August. I would make a mo motion that, uh, or an amendment to the recommendation that 
I would go along with it. it Maybe uh, if we put it off until August and let the public have a more of an input on this. Um, and I think there are benefits to this and there are also uh, detriments to it. But uh, as a board, I think we should, we should have a little more uh, public discussion on this before we make the uh, change. It's a change of something we've been doing for 30 years, approximately. Well, that, uh, so, so I, I appreciate the comment, but I actually disagree with some of the premise of it. As Supervisor Leopold noted when, when I spoke to my predecessor and he spoke to our now assembly member, um, the Board of Supervisors not very long ago used to have this as, as a practice uh, where items, uh, which is by the way the same as the city of Watsonville where you came from, the city of Santa Cruz where Supervisor Coonerty came from that requires that uh, a community member communicate directly with a supervisor or a council member to pull an item in advance. Um, so that, that has not been a 30 year practice. Actually, we're engaged in a new practice in how we've been doing things. Uh, and so this is, in some respects, is a movement back to the way that the board used to do it on that. Uh, but I understand your, your other component of, of, uh, of, of interest of, of pushing the item till August. We st this is an agendized item, we can vote on it today and we need to open it up for the community. So what I'll do now is, is open this item up for the community is to give you an opportunity to address us on item 86 if you have any, um, ideas on it, please feel free to step forward, and if not, we'll move it back to the board for action. Anybody would like to address us? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, member of the public. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. And I think it's ironic that PG&E just got castigated for implementing new things without public input, and here we go, you're doing the same. So. I looked into, uh, and I understand there are a couple of things, Rosenberg's Rules of Order. I read the, the Rosenberg's Rules of Order and the special notes about public input and that it will be in, uh, incumbent upon the chair of the body to rule one, tell the public what the body will be doing. Rule two, tell the public, uh, make sure that the public is informed while the body is doing it. And rule three, when the body has acted, tell the public what the body did. For every agenda item, you must do that. So I like that. It's clear to the public what's going on. So I support adopting the Rosenberg rule of, of order. The problem I have with changing around the agenda is that sometimes, I have to work on Tuesdays. I can go in late and get in trouble <laughs> in the morning before things get busy where I work much easier than I can at 1.30 in the middle of the day and fight the afternoon traffic. So I do not support 10 o'clock or thereafter because that's just as vague as nine o'clock or thereafter, which is what you have now. But I have a better shot at getting some time here in the morning off my job than I do in the middle of the day or thereafter. The other problem I saw is that there are also going to be changes in how the emails will be accepted. Any email communication on agenda items received after 5 p.m. on Monday will not be included. They will be included in the public record but will not be part of the agenda documentation available for the public who is able to take off time to be here on Tuesday mornings. That's not fair because you're saying we want you to go talk with the um, department staff and get your questions answered. Well, the, the agenda is not even available online for those of, th of those of the public who use the internet until Friday afternoon. So you don't, you only have Monday basically to try and get a hold of someone at the county to get your questions answered and they're busy too. So this is not an improvement for public input. And I ask that you make the agenda available sooner if members of the public are going to have to get their own answers and I do not like having to ask permission to pull a consent agenda item. That's not fair to the public. Are you going to ask the public's permission to pull a consent agenda item? It's not fair. Thank you. And, and Ms. Steinbrenner, we already actually do the exact things that Rosenberg requires. I read an agenda item, we tell you who it was that made the motion, and we told you that the action that the body made, this is not a change, and so to imply that it's a change of what the chair currently does is just false. Ms. Um, Garrett, welcome. 
I think this is opposite of what it says. It does not encourage more public participation or enable it. It does the opposite with the points that were just brought up by Becky Steinbrenner. Also, the idea of um, groveling, begging for one of you supervisors to pull an item off the consent agenda is backwards. It, it should be the same. We the people look at this and say, hmm, this is an important item to discuss. I want to discuss it, pull it off the consent agenda, not only for myself, but for other members of the public who would likely be interested. Regarding, and it's funny, when you come up here, Supervisor Leopold, and I'm saying something, you move over to F Supervisor Friend. That's the second time you've done that. I, I don't appreciate that. Uh, the other thing is the oral communication time. Um, I think it should be kept at nine o'clock so people could come and leave and go to their other jobs. 1.30 in the afternoon uh, precludes uh, certainly working people or most people, they can adjust their work schedule to come. The best way to have public participation, of course, as you have been requested many times, is to have meetings in the evening when working people can come or way towards the end of the day. This is impossible for most people to be here. So often you have public hearings and the public isn't here or it's nearly impossible for them to be here. Were I still teaching elementary school, there's no way I could come get a substitute for 20 to 30 children, impossible. So I don't see this as um, an improvement, and I agree with uh, Supervisor Kappa, thank you for that very astute observation that we're deciding what's best for the public without getting the public input, just like PG&E here. Um, that shouldn't be, and I do think it's essential. This is a huge change from procedures that have been in existence for decades, and I think I agree with Supervisor Caput that this needs to come back um, possibly in August and when there can be more discussion of this. It's very disturbing to me how a group of men like yourself make decisions affecting Thank the you, public Garrett. without public input. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on this item? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Victorious Alexander, civil society activist, I just want to remind the American public enjoys celebrating success, achievement, entertainment, and fairness. This is very anti-democratic and is shameful. You know, as a civil society activist, you know, I, the, the, this is a violation of the Brown Act. We, the, we, we're not here to grovel over the system, and we're not here for political servitude. We're active subjects. This is a community of equals. Once again, we want to continue to promote ruling class ideology. Members of the public should be able to come out and weigh in on the political issue and bring the public spirited perspective be able to speak liberating truth to political power. This is a violation of the Brown Act. We shouldn't have to ask, hold on, we shouldn't have to be asking for permission to pull something off the consent calendar. I don't even talk to any of your staff. Your staff don't even make themselves available to me. I don't even know who they are. So you, and then the email, the immiserated population, they don't got time to, to write you an email. And hopefully that you guys can read it. They want to be able to come in here and do this. They want to be able to do this. This is what we need more of, more people to come in and weigh in. The oral communication sounds hetero, uh, homosexual. Well, I want to go in back to public comment. Public comment should be at the very first. The adjacent county, Santa Clara County, that I, that I, that I came out of, <clears throat> they have the public comment because they don't want to inconvenience the public. We're not here for your, for your convenience. You're here for ours, to hear us. We want to weigh in on the political issues, and we need your cooperation, Chairman Friend. You're a good man. 
we need the light item package certified and put back there so that we can come in here and scrutinize it and weigh in and make those qualifying statements. We want to participate. This is not for the rich, the powerful, and the influential. This is for all of us, a community of equals. Thank you. Anybody else like to address this? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I, I, I apologize. No, I thought that was no. my time. I thought that was my time. Is well, you it? You finished. You have finished. Oh, that was finished? Yes. Okay. Well, you have finished. I don't know. I actually wasn't paying attention to the timer, but you were oh, done. Okay. So the timer was oh, okay. Did anybody else like to actually address us on this item? Okay, bring it back to the board. Well, uh, uh, Su Supervisor Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think there was one other part of Rosenberg's, uh, you and I talked about around the, what the chair can do in terms yeah. of making a motion. Do you wanna, I, I was trying to find the exact, the, where that was. There, there's language in here that I think should be struck if we adopt Rosenberg's, which allows the chair to move forward with an item without a second. And I just believe that uh, there should be a second to a motion before the body votes on something and, and that seems like an odd line in there. It does allow the chair to make a motion or a second uh, under certain circumstances, and I think that that's appropriate because right now in this small body it's odd to disenfranchise a chair uh, from being able to do that, but uh, I don't think that we should vote on something without a second. So there's a line in there that, that says that, and I think that should be uh, something we don't adopt. Yeah, so I would be ready to, to make a motion to include that uh, edit in the Rosenberg's rules to uh, uh, adopt the first two parts of this, which is the, um, uh, the well, adopt Rosenberg with the change, uh, adopt the uh, consent items re uh, requirement that um, that a board member uh, request an item to be pulled, um, and that we moved uh, oral communications and consent item uh, communications to the same time. And I'd like to have us come back in six months and look at this question about the calendar to see whether these changes have made the, the, the changes that we um, have had the impact that we'd like or whether we need to, c to consider that once again. So I'll second that uh, motion. Yeah. A motion from Leopold, a second from uh, Coonerty, and then Leopold and I will go to. Let me Leopold, just say just we'll a, one, a, a couple other things. The, um, the idea that people should communicate with board members ahead of time is, is a way of increasing communication with board members. For some uh, people. Uh, that yeah, because they hey, please, you've had your opportunity. Please that don't when I When I worked in community-based organizations and there was an item that I was concerned with the board, I made sure to reach out. Sometimes what I thought was going on with an item wasn't happening. Other times I got good information and it also gave me some idea that there would be at least one supervisor who supported something that I wanted to have changed in there. So I think that's a, th that's a good practice. It's in use by many other places. It was used in this body uh, for many years. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, we often get asked about nighttime meetings. Um, last week, we held two evening meetings uh, about our $777 million budget. Uh, we had a handful of people come in Watsonville and we had exactly no people come here to Santa Cruz. So um, we will still, there may be times where a night meeting is uh, appropriate, but uh, it isn't, it, just because night meeting doesn't make it any more likely that anybody else is gonna show up. Uh, so you wanna look at what, what the issues are. So um, anyway, I would support, I would encourage the support of this motion. Supervisor Caput. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not, I, the problem here is we're, we're deciding on something right now when we could put it back uh, to August. Uh, I, I might agree with uh, some of the, uh, the changes here, but we're what, we're proposing changes to something we're about to adopt. Uh, and the other is, you're, it is correct, uh, uh, Rosenberg's rules are much shorter and much clearer. The problem is uh, we need to look at what we're changing from, which is uh, Sturgis, and Sturgis is complicated, but we need a little time to understand what we're actually changing from that complication, whether or not it's better in the interests of the public or not. Uh, 
there's differences in the rule. Uh, the City Council of Watsonville is under Robert's Rules of Order. So that, uh, the, that involves uh, abstentions. Uh, Sturgis, Rosenberg, uh, and Roberts are all different on when one, one of us abstains. I know in the Roberts rules, you actually have to get up out of your seat. And otherwise, if you sit there in the seat that we're occupying and say, I abstain, it doesn't count as an abstention, it counts as a yes vote. Uh, under Rosencrantz, it's, it does not. I don't know about uh, Sturgis, though. What, what I'm getting at is, what's the rush? Let's just put it off until August, and a little, uh, we'll have some more public uh, input, and we'll see whether or not we are actually are uh, making a decision in the best interest of the public. But in order to do that, we need to hear from the public beforehand. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, is anybody, uh, do, I, do I have to make a motion to put it off? Uh, oh, you can make a motion to amend and see if there's a second to that amendment. Is that under Sturgis or under Rosenberg? <laughs> <laughs> and a motion to amend would be under yeah, actually all of the operating rules S order. Supervisor Caput, the, here's the I'd, thing I'd that, like that, I would, that I would just say is um, we're not making all these, my motion does not mean all these changes will be made, but we are going to come back in six months um, to, to see whether what we've done uh, makes a difference and whether we want to make any change, additional changes, including the ones suggested here by the subcommittee. I think that'll give us some time to, to see how this process is working um, in, in real time. Um, and, uh, and there might be, a, at that moment, we may want to make uh, changes uh, beyond what we've uh, talked about here today. There, there could be uh, good things to this. I just, uh, I'm kind of like other people in the public, I just want more time. So I'm, I'm going to. There is a motion to amend. Put is it there, off until no. Is, is uh, there a second August. to the motion to amend? Okay. Is there a, is okay. There a second? All right. So, so seeing no. Ms. Garrett, can you please stop disrupting the meeting? If you disrupt the meeting one more time, I'm going to have to request that you leave this meeting. There's been four times now that you have been speaking from the public. Please just respect the fact that we're trying to hold a meeting here. Okay, we have a motion to amend. Is there a second to the motion to amend? Seeing none, we'll move back to the original motion. All those in favor of the original motion say aye. 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 Opposed? No. It passes four to one with Supervisor Caput dissenting. We'll move on to item 86.1, which is pulled item 74. Pulled item 74 is to approve the amendment to agreement with Mott McDonald by extending the contract term to June 30th, 2020 for on-call traffic engineering consultant services at $125,000 per fiscal year and take related actions as recommended by the deputy CAO. We have the agenda item board memo, the amendment, the fee schedule, the sole source, and the amendment. Uh, Ms. Uh, Steinbrenner, you pulled this item. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to pull this item today. Um, my name is Becky Steinbrenner. I do have concerns having read the documentation around um, extending the Mott McDonald and keeping them on uh, for $125,000 per fiscal year. In the documentation, it cited the primary reason to keep this company on as a consultant is the Aptos Village project improvements. Um, I think there were a lot of problems with the phase one. And there's another item that we're, we're going to discuss here in a minute about the phase one Aptos Village traffic improvements. And um, I, I have a lot of concern about the county taxpayers having to spend inordinate amount of money to make the improvements that are necessary to accommodate the Aptos Village project developers when the TIA fees paid by these developers are really reduced because of poor calculations, because of um, inaccurate calculations. And there, in the mitigations, there were zero traffic mitigations by the developer for this project. There was one traffic mitigation in st at State Park done by the county. So this is not fair, and I ask that you not approve this extension because it seems to me it is purely to assist the Aptos Village project developers. 
and I wanna know if it is extended, how those mistakes that were made in phase one will be addressed in phase two, which is Perkin right along. And I'd like to hear a discussion about this uh, from our new public works director. Thank you very much. Thank you, so moving it back to the board, are there any questions on this item? Is there anybody else from the community that'd like to address this on this item, excuse me? I apologize for not keeping open public comment on this. Please. So I guess this is the last day members of the public can pull an item themselves, right? We have to contact you in advance to do it now. That's really anti-democratic to the hilt. This seems to be just another way the taxpayer funds are paying for a huge development project for the profit of the developer, Svensson, and I guess Appenrod, and this is not what our taxpayer funds are supposed to be used for. They're supposed to benefit the public, and uh, that huge Silicon Valley type project with the traffic congestion, the high water use, that the county repairs the roads damaged by this work of the developer. You see why people are discouraged or don't trust government when it doesn't represent them. Anybody specifically to this contract would like to speak to us on that? Yeah, yeah, I was able to peruse that. This is the last time we're gonna be able to speak freely. It seems like the County Board of Supervisors wants to put a bullet in public comment and participating. Mr. Alexander, I, to the contract. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I wanna be able to say this. I support uh, Becky Steinbrenner's leadership. Long li li liberty, thank you. Okay, anybody else on something germane to this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Is there, are there Move. questions or an action? Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on to item 86.2, which is pulled 83.2, which is approved contract change order in the amount of $137,138.62 for the Aptos Village Improvements Phase One project and take related actions as recommended by the Deputy CAO. We have the memo, the contract change order, and the amendment. Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner of Aptos. Um, I, uh, this uh, additional um, $137,138.62 payment to John Madonna Construction Company, a contractor from San Luis Obispo, not even a local contractor, um, is to pay for the extra um, expenses of doing night work on the Trout Gulch intersection. That was really good. That was a smart move because, as you know, it's a very busy intersection. My question is, um, why, this is the second time in a row, second meeting, there's been a change order after the fact. This work was done last March. Does it really take that long to, uh, to make these, these payments? You're just now approving the, the change order for work that was done six, six months ago, five months ago. And um, the whole issue is, it seems like this, this project has ballooned in cost. Last meeting you had a $26,000 payment to train their workers for hazardous materials when the, the, the company is certified to handle hazardous materials. And now we're paying them an additional 137,000. This does not seem like transparent government to me when a project happens with an open checkbook and the public is not given the opportunity to really weigh in on how these major processes will go. The Aptos Village Traffic Improvement blog was not kept current. The public had no idea really of what was gonna go on. I went to this nighttime um, work. People didn't know it was happening and they were being routed to Freedom Boulevard rather than over Granite Way, which was much shorter. 
there, there's a real flaw here, and I want to make sure as phase two comes along that the true cost of a project is going to be given to the public. We heard this morning that there's no money for public roads, for the rural roads, and here we are paying this amount of money for nighttime work, which was valid, very good. But I'm concerned that, that there's an open checkbook for these big projects, especially the Aptos Village project development, that is a gift of public money in many respects. And the public needs to be informed and this process needs to be more clear. I, I approve of the nighttime work that was done at Trout Gulch. What I don't approve of is that it has, the cost has been kept from the public and it is not a clear process for putting these things out to bid. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on this item? Again, public money to pay for the cost of this disastrous project. Having lived in Aptos for 37 years, it's just so distressing to me to see the traffic it, it's just, it's just all the trees cut down. Um, it, it, why, how, it's just happening with every project. I think of an article I read years ago by Barbara Graves, the hidden costs of development. We're told we're getting tax money from these developments, but it seems like it's the other way around for the county. We're paying our taxpayer money for some big moneyed interest. It's it's just not right. What, what democracy is this? Okay. Would anybody else like to address us specifically on the contract change order? Okay. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to move, the board. Move approval. Second. A motion from Coonerty, a second from Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. It passes. Unanimously, we'll now move on to item 88. It's quite unclear why uh, Robin Musatelli is announcing her retirement. <laughs> but we'd like to have a presentation honoring County Supervisors Analyst Robin Musatelli on her retirement as outlined in the memo that I did with Supervisor McPherson. And uh, I will actually kick it off with a very short uh, note that I got from Supervisor Peary that uh, sent me a note to ensure that this was uh, read. Hi Robin, I wish I could be there in person to thank you again for your support and your friendship while I was representing the second district. All the current and <coughs> former supervisors know uh, having someone smart and trustworthy at their side is essential. You understood complex political issues, won the hearts of our constituents, always gave me honest input and stood by me in difficult political and personal times. I'll be forever grateful for your support and I hope the next chapter in your life is as wonderful uh, is a wonderful time with lots of fun, family and grandbabies. All the best to you, my friend, love, <laughs> Ellen. Um, Robin, you are an institution here, an institution in this county, an institution for the second district. People still um, tell me how much you meant to them serving the second district for the 12 years that you did. Um, I mean, some people wonder where they leave a legacy in life. There's no question that you have left a significant legacy, not just in this position, but what your history in journalism as well. Um, you know, we can't thank you enough. Uh, and on top of that, you're a, you're a real remarkable and beautiful person. Uh, you have a remarkably generous heart. You have a wonderful family. You've raised some great kids that have also entered into public service. Um, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding with everything you've done in your life and your life choices, and we are gonna miss you remarkably. Um, I'd like to pass it on over to Supervisor McPherson. I know all the board members would like to make comments, but Supervisor McPherson. Right, and I, I know that um, Robin's not gonna like any of this because it's about her. So <laughs> that's just the way she is and she'd rather be riding at the Silver Ranch on a horse or something like that right now, I think. If, uh, but uh, I just, uh, I can't tell you how much, uh, well, I've, I've known Robin for some, t for some time uh, in the first life in the news business at the Santa Cruz Sentinel. Uh, we were together in the newsroom and uh, she was just as, um, well liked and respected as I said before uh, there as she is in this county building and throughout county government. I can't believe uh, how she makes a complicated 
problem, understandable in government tees, if you will. She is uh, just a phenomenal person, as you said, and that's uh, just at the heart of it. But uh, what she has done uh, for me in this position as the fifth district supervisor and for the entire county uh, and the people who are in it is just remarkable. She is uh, at the top of the list. She's just a class act all around, and I really have appreciated her being here, and I've threatened to resign too, uh, but I guess I'm, I'm gonna hang on for a little while longer. But uh, anyway, uh, Robin, thank you so much for everything that you have done for uh, the county and for me, and uh, you have a wonderful family, and Howard, uh, I don't know, I hope you keep the reins on the horse there, so it, uh, it's all right. You, you're a tremendous family, great grandkids. Thank you very much for everything you've done for us. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, it's really nice to see the young kids here in the uh, uh, meeting today, and uh, uh, when, my, when my kids, when I would bring them over, uh, they went over to your office first because uh, they knew they could play there. They knew they could break things without getting in trouble. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate your patience on that. And you also came out, uh, well, actually some of the other supervisors too brought out different things uh, that my kids could uh, play with and break. So I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and. Uh, um, when, when, would be, when is your last day, actually? Is, is it today, or is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's July 30th. You know, I got just, I'm gonna interrupt. I, you know, Robin is best known for the pranks that she does on April Fool's Day, and she has reeled in more people than you know, but I am very glad to say that we got her uh, through an idea that was by another former supervisor whose name I'm not gonna <laughs> mention, but Ryan Coonerty is uh, <laughs> to be responsible <laughs> for that. When we changed her retirement date to July 31st and she, we had the personnel office and everybody coming in and, and just saying, we've gotta, you can't do this now. You gotta wait till July 31st. And until yesterday, she was had some doubts. So it's great, we got her, we got her back. <laughs> supervisor Coonerty. Uh, sure. So, uh, so first of all, um, I live in fear of, you, of the retribution that's coming, uh, especially now that you have all this free time to sit around and think. Uh, but I just, I mean, if you look at the, the policies that you've been involved in that have shaped our county and in such a positive way over the years in cottage food and cannabis just recently, but, but going back decades here, uh, but I think, you know, a primary legacy is that you've managed to remain positive and upbeat um, even as you came from journalism and government, which are two uh, inst uh, sort of careers that don't always reward people being positive and, um, and, maintain, and not being, becoming cynical, and you've, you've stayed positive and upbeat, and it's translated to, to, to next generations of community service. It's great, and then if you also, I think if you look in the back of the room, the fact that you have other supervisors, analysts here, uh, who all wanna be here, and who all see you as a role model, um, your legacy will continue here for, uh, for many, many years, and thank you for your service. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, uh, Robin. Uh, You've uh, sort of been covering the community in lots of different ways, first as a reporter and then here on the board offices. Uh, I had the pleasure of working across the hall from you when we did, didn't give uh, um, uh, board staff a, a windows. Uh, <laughs> and so I saw how hard you worked um, and I saw the way you dealt with uh, constituents. Uh, and for someone who has such a broad knowledge of what's going on in the county, and also has a finger on the pulse of the community where you live, um, uh, is, is, is incredible for the person that you work for, uh, but it's really a benefit to all the people that you worked with. Um, uh, through it all, you've also been able to keep an incredible sense of humor. And as, uh, as Supervisor Coonerty just mentioned, you, you come from uh, two professions that uh, raise a lot of cynics instead of uh, people with good humor. And the fact that you've been able to keep that humor as part of everything you do um, is a humanizing part of county government. And so I thank you for that. And I don't know who will take the horse reins here uh, on, the, on the board and the staff, uh, 
but uh, we'll look for someone who has the equal base of knowledge as you did about all things horses. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Uh, Mr. Palacios. Uh, Robin, I just want to say that uh, I've known you for more than 25 years when I was uh, working in Watsonville and you were working for Supervisor Peary at the time. And we often interacted with your office and you were always so kind and uh, generous to us and we appreciated that. And now that I've been with the county, uh, on behalf of the county administrative office, I know that we have great respect for you and we want to thank you for all the effort and work uh, that you've done for the county and that you worked with us on over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the other horse reigns, Ms. McRae. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Chair. Ryan, the retribution has begun. <laughs> I happened to be over there this morning at your offices when a call came into reception saying that Robin had had some kind of an event that wouldn't allow her to be here today. <laughs> so you should live in fear because she will get you back. I was only the victim once, but I'll never forget it. Uh, one of the things I love about you, and you're one of my favorite people, is how you hide your intelligence and competence behind this free-spirited, beautiful persona. And for people who know Robin, they'll like this story because you do the same thing as a horsewoman. And one of my <laughs> enduring memories of Robin is being on a horseback ride. She got a little too far ahead of me because my horse is slower than hers. And I thought I better catch up because it was a technical ride with a sheer drop off to a forest floor. I come around the corner where I can see her again. She's got her helmet dangling over her wrist like a bracelet and her girth is swinging in the wind. And if you don't know, that's what keeps the saddle on the horse. So I love that memory of you, Robin, and I don't have to miss you because we'll keep riding together. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll now open it up for the community. Is anybody from the community that'd like to address us uh, on this item? Yes, um, you know, I've been coming to these meetings since about 2000, and when Robin was working in Ellen Peary's office, I always found her very helpful and responsive, and I enjoyed the interaction with her. And you reminded me that she worked for, as a news reporter for the Sentinel, right? And. When I was teaching in Watsonville, we formed a group, Farm Without Harm, because we were trying to have ecological organic agriculture and not having the pesticides poisoning the community and our children. And one of the articles that was covered was in the Sentinel, written by Robin Musatelli, and I have it in my files, and I think a lot of the focus then was on this uh, methyl bromide, which is a class one ozone destroyer, damages lung size, kidney skin. It was a very fine article and with photographs going in it. So I really uh, appreciate your work and your help here over the years. And also you were talking about your predecessor. One of the most important um, accomplishments, I think, of Ellen Peary and um, Mark Stone was when they did this integrated pest management policy, but the basic thing it did, in my opinion, was it stopped this indiscriminate roadside spraying with Roundup. It, it just looked like a swath of death all over the county. And they stopped that, because you know the weeds can just be cut down. So I appreciate your work, and I appreciate that accomplishment, the key accomplishment in this county, in my opinion, was stopping the roadside spring. And I felt more representative by the previous supervisor than the present one, I'm sorry to say. Thank you, Rob. That's fine, I, I will let her know. Is there anybody else that'd like to address us on this item? Quickly, uh, Jeff Gaffney, Director for County Parks. I just wanted to say, in kind of line with what you were saying, Dana, that the beauty, the wisdom, the courage, the strength that you have, um, it's all underneath the surface and it's right there. You don't see it if you don't pay attention. And I'm very fortunate that I got a chance to work with you. Um, 
and I'll thank you for all that you've done for us, for the county. You are truly uh, a public servant and you've served the community for many years and it's time for you to take your, your own time for yourself and your family and, and it's, it's truly a sacrifice that you've given and, and it's time for you to have your own time. Anybody else? Kathy Malloy, and on behalf of the planning department, I wanted to also extend our congratulations and just, you know, the three words that come to mind is kindness, patience, just the, your humanity is just so deep and kind and wonderful. And I guess uh, what sums it up is the words that Bruce just used too, which is really just a class act. So congratulations. Would anybody else like to address us? You act like you don't know the procedure. <laughs> Sort of we odd. don't. We just want to have the last word. And we were going to do a song and dance, but that's probably highly inappropriate. <laughs> we just wanted to really thank you for being such a great colleague. And uh, I know that I have big shoes to fill, and I'm honored to uh, try to pick up your legacy where you left off. And thank you for making this transition so smooth. We'll sing to you later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to step up a little early. Um, something that the people don't realize that, you know, Robin and I have been together for quite a while. When she worked at the Sentinel, every Friday night, she brought home the board packet. And sometimes it was pushing three inches thick. So this goes back 25 years. She has read every board packet for over 25 years to cover government for the Sentinel. Little sidebar. <laughs> I could go a thousand places, but that's... All right, we will bring it back to the board. Doesn't mean, Robin, we're not gonna force you to speak in a minute, but while you're still under county employment. But I'll bring it back to Supervisor McPherson. We do have a proclamation that needs to be adopted by the board. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I would like to, uh, much of many of the comments have been made uh, to, uh, to uh, make a, uh, a motion that we adopt this re resolution, pass this uh, re proclamation honoring Robin uh, Mustelli on her re retirement. Came to San Jose Valley in 1978, worked at the Sentinel, the, the Mercury News, the Press Banner. Uh, she's uh, just really appreciated also in her community. She was named Woman of the Year last year in San Jose Valley. Uh, she loves the valley. And uh, more than anything, you can tell she loves her family because uh, they're sitting all around her. So I would like to make a motion that we uh, uh, accept this uh, uh, proclamation honoring Robin Musatelli on her retirement. Second. A motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor of the proclamation? Aye. Opposed? to say something. <laughs> Thank you all so much, and it has been such a privilege to work here. I love my job. I've always loved my job. And now I'm gonna cry, so thank you very much. And thank you, thank you, thank you all. Recess. Uh, we do actually have a reception in the fifth floor conference room. I believe it's one over here in the corner. Uh, so we invite you all to participate in the uh, reception. The board will also uh, take a recess for lunch and we'll come back here at 1.30 when we reconvene.
Good afternoon, everybody. We're gonna bring back into session the Board of Supervisors. We have one more item that had been moved to our regular agenda, and then we're going to go straight into oral communications after that. That was item 79, got moved to 89.1. That is a continued public hearing to consider certification of the vote results for county service areas, number 23, Old Ranch Road, uh, Loman Terrace, 36 Forest Glen, uh, the B. Hayward Zone, and 59 McGaffigan Mill Road, and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO Director of Public Works. Uh, uh, Mr. Palacios, do you have something you just want to add to this? I know that this is a vote tabulation, it's just a certification of the votes that were cast on each of these CSAs. Uh, yes, I have nothing to add. But so this is a continued public hearing, so we'll now open up the public hearing. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us specifically on these county service area items? Again, it's just a certification of the votes on these items. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. We'll close the public hearing for action. I move approval of the recommended actions. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll now open it up for oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, this will be an opportunity. You'll have three minutes. Would anybody like to address us during oral communications? Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, chairman, uh, supervisors. Um, again, I'm concerned about the, uh, the censorship that was done uh, by the chairman of the uh, Board of Supervisors here and by Mr. Leopold, uh, physical threats and what might happen to a, a building. Um, supposedly that censorship went through and was joined with a, organ a institution that's part of COPA. COPA is uh, a Saul Alinsky uh, organization. Um, it runs through the uh, Industrial Areas Foundation and includes a number of uh, collectivist or, or Marxist churches in one of our school districts here. Um, what was done under the uh, protection, the same speaker that was speaking at Freedom uh, Forum also spoke at the Resource Center for Nonviolence. And uh, Ryan Coonerty certainly uh, uh, is connected with the Resource Center for Nonviolence. He had no objection to that. Uh, so the targeting of this organization that's been out there for 10 years is a true violation of free speech and then using violence is way beyond what you supervisors should be doing. Um, the supervisors should distance themselves from those people who made the threats. Uh, these same supervisors, all of you, still support uh, a, a couple of plaques out in front of the courthouse building dedicated to an espionage anti-American spy, Hugh DeLacy. Um, since some of this attack came from COPA, which is made up of a number of churches. I think it's important to remember that one of the first uh, communist fronts was the uh, Methodist Federation for Social Action. They formed even before the revolution in, in, uh, <coughs> in Russia. Um, also, under the Federal uh, Council of Churches, uh, John Foster Dallas called for uh, duties now performed by local and national governments can now effectively be carried out only by international authority, adequate international police forces, and provisions for worldwide authority uh, should come from them. We have an organization called, which is a COG, Council of Governments, which is the uh, AMBAG Association. All of the authority from the cities and counties is being moved there. The newspapers won't mention it at all, and Mr. McPherson has been chairman of that from time to time, who also received thousands of dollars from a Chinese communist triple agent. Um, I believe that uh, the pushing uh, by some of the churches that are being uh, neutralized and taken over, uh, such as COPA, and their inflection of uh, talking about democracy, whereas if you go back to the definition put out by the uh, Army Manual, they warn against democracy. Democracy was never mentioned by the Founding Fathers. Uh, we have a, a democratic republic which uh, controls and gives uh, civility to change. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us during oral communications? Well, Mr. Alexander is getting ready. If anybody else would like to come forward, now's your opportunity. Please feel free. Thank you for waiting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
I'm here in, uh, to express my opposition to the 80 plus uh, close, pro close proximity microwave radiation antennas that are planned for Santa Cruz County. Right now there's not 80 in the application process, but that apparently is the total that uh, Verizon in this case would like to install in Santa Cruz. Um, this is a huge complicated issue and uh, far too many uh, facets to it to uh, address them all in three minutes, but the, I think the unifying um, issue that, that is not complicated is when uh, in a neighborhood someone is to learn that one of these so-called small cell uh, antennas is to be installed either on their property or their next door neighbor or across the street, they're opposed. So <laughs> um, in the neighborhoods, uh, I'm not an anti-cell phone, I'm not anti-wireless, it's, it's here to stay. But these facilities, again, which they call small cell antennas, are not small at all. They're, they're <laughs> quite ugly. The, uh, there's t uh, many other designs that could be considered to uh, make them a little more aesthetic, and I understand aesthetics is one of the uh, reasons that uh, these can be denied or delayed or asked to be reconsidered. Um, there are safety issues, privacy issues, property value issues. Can't go into all the details about all of that, but I think a unifying uh, point is that in neighborhoods, near homes, near, near residences, people who would be affected by that are pretty unified against it. Um, it could be confined to commercial areas and, and main, main streets. That's it? That's three minutes? Uh, it's two minutes, you have one more minute. Oh, okay. Um, and this is an issue in, nationwide, but uh, in the Bay Area, it's, it's, there's a lot of resistance in numerous cities where this is happening. And uh, it, Monterey successfully stopped an installation of a number of these. Sebastopol as well, Hillsborough is fighting it. Palo Alto has a lot of them already and they're trying to prevent more. Danville, Santa Rosa, Sonoma, Petaluma, all these places. Strong opposition to as these are presented. Uh, again, I don't think they're anti-cell, it's just how this rollout is occurring. It seems like uh, corporate interests are taking precedent over residential, uh, over community interests. And it seems to be up to the powers that be, supervisors, city councils, et cetera, to put the public interest first. Thank you. And sir, what is your name for the record? Paul DeSoma. Thank you. Thank we you. did receive a letter, I believe, you sent to. Okay. <laughs> is there anybody else like to address us during oral communications? Please feel free to step forward. Thanks to the previous speaker. I'm not the only one. There are a lot of people who oppose being microwaved and harmed and having their property devalued. And to remind people, and I, I don't know that guy, I just met him. This is a detector of the microwave radiation and it's the amplified sound. <laughs> Don't you love to hear that? So I, I've said this before, I'll say it again, I'm on Freedom Boulevard where I take the bus. Thanks to you, Mr. Friend. Uh, the 13 cell towers in a square mile on utility poles for Verizon 4G, soon to be the platform for 5G. I had no reading on this meter before they were activated. Now it's up there, so everybody is getting more radiation. I met a woman who lives near one of these, stone throw away, she had a stroke. That's one of the symptoms of heart problems. And the 5G, I gave you a copy of the appeal of doctors and scientists calling for a halt to the 5G rollout. And uh, just briefly, over 230 scientists from more than 40 countries have already expressed their serious concerns regarding the ubiquitous and increasing exposure to radio frequency radiation generated by electric and wireless devices already 
before the addition of the 5G rollout, they refer to the fact that, quote, numerous recent scientific publications have shown that EMF affects living organisms at level well below most international and national guidelines. Effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damage, structure and functional changes, the reproductive system, learning, memory deficits, uh, neurological disorders, and negative impacts in general well-being and human damage goes well beyond the human race as there is growing evidence of harmful effects to the plants and animals. Does this sound like a good future for your children? I don't think so. Every effort needs to be made to stop this. In addition to the 5G rollout on the ground, there are plans to launch about 20,000 satellites for 5G. Elon Musk is part of this, and I'll give you a copy of this article, Planetary Emergency by Arthur Furstenberg. Talks about the electrical envelope or circuit of the Earth. We are all, all life is dependent on being ruined. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Anybody else like to address us during oral communications? Please feel free to step forward. Good afternoon, supervisors. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to address you here today. Thank you, um, Supervisor Leopold, for motioning to hear about an update on the negotiations at Janus of Santa Cruz. Um, hopefully you got that update um, based on the county's conversations with Janus. We wanted to provide our own update and we'll do so formally as well um, in, in email. Um, as we said last week, we're appealing for wage increases that are simply fair and in, in line with the county's own living wage ordinance. Um, to start at $16 for our treatment techs and support staff and $20 for counselors. Um, we wish the CEO of Janus, Rudy Escalante, were here to make that appeal with us. Um, but we will continue to advocate on behalf of the caregivers at Janus and for the patients and clients who are being turned away or receiving inadequate care due to staffing shortfalls. Um, you heard some of the stories last week um, and th those members, some of them came back today to, to share more with you. Um, and they've taken out, again, their time to be here today. Um, we'd like to work with you and your offices and the offices of the health services agency. We know there's always flexibility in budgets and we'd like to see what opportunities there might be to increase funding for Janus. Um, you heard last week how dire the working conditions are and how in turn that affects the quality of client care. At Janus, we need to figure something out um, and we're here to ask for your help. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome back. Let me throw my phone around real quick. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again. Um, <clears throat> so again, my name is Matthew Van Eyes. I work at Janus of Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm an intensive outpatient treatment counselor there. And, um, you know, I spoke to you last time about sort of my personal story and um, how Janus assisted me in turning my life around. Um, and I just wanted to um, uh, turn um, attention a little more to some of the clients um, that I've dealt with since I've been there and um, working there and uh, how important continuity of care is in the changes that um, uh, take shape in these people's lives. Uh, and I can think of three examples in particular, um, one of which being, I used to work at the Sobering Center as well, also run by Janice. And um, there was a particular gentleman there who um, was in and out every day just sort of your street level, uh, you know, in the gutter alcoholic, you know. Came in, went out, came in, went out, constantly trying to talk to him about getting into recovery. Uh, eventually, um, through the relationships made with that gentleman by myself and in particular by uh, Edgar here, um, this gentleman finally developed enough trust in us to go forward with that um, uh, process, um, got into detox, then got into residential treatment, 30 day, and then got into my intensive outpatient treatment. Um, the reason he stuck around in my intensive outpatient treatment is because he knew me. 
I was a face that he recognized and he trusted me from my time and my interactions with him at the sobering center. That's one textbook example of how continuity of care is crucial in changing people's lives around. And not to put to find a point on it, this gentleman was costing taxpayers all kinds of money being on the streets day in, day out, uh, uh, law enforcement resources, theft, etc. cetera. Um, another ex a good example is um, a couple of clients who have uh, been in my intensive outpatient treatment uh, group, went out, were successful in recovery for a brief period of time, fell back out, which is typical with recovery. Recovery is not a straight line. Uh, it's a circuitous path sometimes. Those gentlemen both called me and because I was still working there, asked if they could come back into group and they're back in group now on the right path. If I weren't working there right now, they wouldn't know anybody else there, they wouldn't trust anybody because to them, I'm the face of Janice. So continuity of care is key. Having consistency in the uh, employment of the uh, employees there is crucial. The time is now to do something about this so that we can really continue to impact these people's lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us in oral communications? Uh, my name's Jason Lubin. I'm a uh, counselor at Janus, DUI department. And I just want to segue into what Matt said here, very important. Um, I've noticed that clients who do come back for treatment, maybe a second or a third time, what we call uh, uh, difficult clientele or, you know, clientele with a deep history, a long history of uh, substance use disorder and abuse. Uh, I've noticed they often ask, just like Matt mentioned, where is that counselor? What happened to that counselor? Um, because they want to kind of bond back with, you know, or rejoin with their original facilitator in that group. Now, that's not always possible because, especially in the DUI department, we're constantly having people come in and out. But that's a big concern of a lot of clients I have heard on our side, that what's happened with all, you know, with all your staff? Where is this person? Where is that person? Um, I just want to say that you know, Janice is planning as soon as uh, they get uh, they get accepted or the, their their expansion at the RTC uh, and detox is approved because I think they're coming up for inspection. So as soon as that inspection is approved, they're going to be expanding their their population pretty uh, significantly. And, you know, a lot of our concerns are, is this going to amplify further this kind of turnover that's been happening? Uh, and uh, we're trying to be a little proactive about that in appealing for um, maybe at least that you consider some way to give us a little bit more funds to raise the living standards of a lot of our staff. So, thank you. Good afternoon, board. My name is Edgar Fuerte. I was here last week, so I'm sure you remember me. Uh, one issue I didn't speak about last week that has to do with the sobering center that I think about three of you up there know about is our bathroom issue, our restroom facility, which those of you that say you're going to visit haven't checked it out yet. But uh, I spoke with someone before the meeting. She said, I think she works with one of you. She said she's wanting to go over there this week and check it out. I told her, go there Thursday morning. I'll be there 7 a.m. to 3.30, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So hopefully she shows up. And uh, then I can show her what it's all about. Other than that, it's, you know, it's really out of my hands. I can advocate so much, we can uh, beat the dead horse so much, but it's up to group conscience, which that is you. Uh, the end result, it, it will be what it will be, and that's all I can say. You guys know what we're here for, and there's not much more to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else during this time? Mr. Alexander. Uh, I just want to be able to, to remind members of the public what it is to be a good flag-waving American, because we are good people. We celebrate success, achievement, and entertainment. 
God bless you. I wanna be able to let members of the public know that I got court on the 28th in right here in at the harassment court because of my outspoken criticism. And I just wanna be able to say this, I was barbecuing, and I know I bring in the hot topics. I bring the unscripted reality in here. I use the unforced force of the speech act to push up on the control system, but I burnt what I was barbecuing. Devil ducky soup. Because that's all it seems like it's, it's happening here. You know, with the light item 86, right? Putting a bullet in our public comment. But I wanna be able to say this, the American public is rising up. In Santa Clara County, we threw out, we, at, we afflicted the legal community by ousting out the corrupt Judge, judge Persky, right, with our recall power. And the DA over there, everybody knows, DA Jeff Rosen, they heavy handed. A lot of activists are mobilizing November, they're gonna do also the recall. They're gonna, they're gonna recall him. This is what we need to impose on the legal community. We need to impose a psychological reform on the judicial system because it's corrupting our common life. I'm tired of fighting with that legal community to come at it right. And it seems like the establishment, you know, from the county council's office here, to the board of the clerk, to the uh, board of supervisors, to the human health services with uh, Ellen Timberlake and, and, her, and her minions over there are just imposing arbitrary rule. Totally bypassing the uh, due process and equal protection clause. I have, to, it's almost gonna be two o'clock and I'm doing public comment, you know? This is shameful. This is mimicking the same zombie politics in San Jose, um, in Santa Clara County. Well, you know, we want a, a political system that, hey, we're gonna be able to promote the equal advancement of class interests. You know, you hear about the Jandis, uh, 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 you know, you hear them. But in my, my heart goes out to them, because I, I, I wanna tell you straight out, man, they're social dumping. There ain't no help. <clears throat> we gotta stick together and we gotta push up on the system with gumbo diplomacy and moral force and demand accountability demand to exercise our constitutional rights, because this is a constitutional republic. And I understand people, you know, the, the wealthy people, all they wanna do, the ruling class ideology that runs this system, they're running it to the ground, because they're excluding people like myself that will bring in the public spirited perspective. I'm not a functionary bureaucrat. I know my place, I'm high-minded, I value my economic humanity. And I would want my brothers as well, to be funded, and I would want other people, so we need to, we need to band together, because politics is about our political life together. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else during oral communications? Is there anybody beyond this next speaker? Please. Okay, this will be the final speaker of oral communications. Welcome, thanks for waiting. Hi, um, my name's Marsh Blaker. Um, I live in Live Oak, and um, I became aware of um, the cell towers that are being proposed by Verizon, totally by mistake. We were out in front of our house and some surveyors were present and we started asking them questions and they told us that yes, you know, um, Verizon was submitting applications for um, cell towers, small, they call them small cell towers, but um, other than that, we would have never known what was going on with the um, installations and the proposed installations, of which there are 80 applications by Verizon for these um, small cell towers. I have a picture of the small cell towers that, you know, I would love for you to see. I also put together a map of the latest um, 11 um, planned cell towers that are all in Live Oak and they're all within about a two mile radius of each other. And um, there, some of them are in, one of them is in front of the Grange Hall, which is where Live Oak it gets together for community services. I mean, really, you're, th you're thinking about putting a cell phone tower right in front of the Grange Hall. It's a historic place. It, it just doesn't belong there. They actually, this is the biggest, um, the largest biological experiment ever attempted because 
they really don't know what these micro, it's a new band that they're going to open up, the 5G. It's got smaller um, microwaves than ever used before. So they're really unclear about um, what exactly these are going to do to life, to people. Uh, the firemen were able to um, be exempt from any cell phone towers on their stations at this point because uh, Assembly Bill 57 was passed because firemen were examined and every fireman they examined had abnormalities in the brain. So they were able to get a bill passed so that they no longer have to have cell phone towers on or near their stations, which was a common practice before. Thank you. So we will conclude oral communications. I, I would like to say that the time certain oral communications did seem to work. People actually showed up and we had a good turnout. So that will end uh, oral communications. I know that before we begin our budget hearings, the clerk needs just a couple minutes to get set up for our next item. So um, we'll just take a couple minute break here till two o'clock while she gets set up. All right, we are going to reconvene and do our budget hearings now. Uh, the first item of budget hearings is actually just to say that we're going to move item four, which is uh, regarding the critical unmet needs, to the very last item. So we'll move to after item six. And we'll start with the revisions and corrections to our last day items, uh, Mr. Palacios. Yes, on, on item number two, uh, we have a correction, item attachment B, the title should read last day report pages 65 through 69. There's also additional materials, revised memo printout packet page 33. On item number three, there's additional materials, revised memo printout packet pages 40 to 41. On item number four, there's additional materials, a memo, a board memo printout attachment A. On item number five, there's a correction. Item attachment A title should read last day report page 77. Uh, there's also revised memo printout packet page 84. And then finally on item number six, there's a correction. Uh, item attachment A title should read last day reports pages 79 through 104. There's additional materials revised memo printout packet page 91. 
Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. We'll begin with a brief introduction from Ms. Mowry. Welcome back. Thank you for all your work, by the way, on the budget. I know that it's a significant amount of work you do to put this all together, and we do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, um, Chair Friend, members of the board, Christina Mallory, the County Budget Manager, and I have with me today Trish Daniels, one of our senior analysts who oversees the unified fee schedule. Um, so you have before you a public hearing to consider the adoption of the resolution approving the amendments to the unified fee schedule for fiscal year 2018-19 including any supplemental budget materials as outlined in the reference budget documents, uh, supplemental pages 187 to 332, and a last day um, includes an addendum pages 41 through 64. It's recommended that your board open the public hearing, uh, take testimony and hear objections, if any, to the proposed unified fee schedule changes, close the public hearing, and adopt the resolution revising the unified fee schedule and staff from the departments, and we're here today to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. So did the board have any questions or comments regarding item one regarding the unified fee schedule? Okay, seeing none, we will now open up the public hearing. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us specifically on uh, the resolution approving amendments to the unified fee schedule for fiscal year 18 and 19, including all the supplemental budget materials. Anybody like to comment on that item? We will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Chair, I'd like to uh, move. Uh, Chair, I'd like to move um, the recommended actions on the unified fee schedule. Express our appreciation to uh, uh, both Ms. Daniels and Ms. Mowry uh, for putting together the information so clearly. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. That item passes unanimously. Item two in regards to the continuing agreement list is to consider the continuing agreements list for 1819, including the addendum, and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the continuing agreements list, the supplemental pages, and the addendum. Okay. And again, it's recommended that your board take any public comment and approve the continuing agreements list and take the related actions as outlined in the memo um, to authorize the county department heads to negotiate and execute the agreements listed in the continuing agreements list, authorize the county department heads and or uh, board chairperson to sign the continuing grant applications and revenue agreements uh, contained in the list, and authorize the auditor controller to adjust the continuing agreements list for any changes and appropriations made by the board during budget hearings and correct any errors. Questions or comments from board members? We'll now open it up to the community. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on the continuing agreements list for 18 and 19. Anybody like to address us on that item? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move, I'll move the recommended action. Second. A motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move on to item three, mm -hmm. which is to consider the last day reports for the 1819 budget as provided in the reference last day and concluding report budget document as outlined in the memo of the CAO. Thanks, Ms. Daniels. The departmental last day reports, pages one through 39, the resolution amending resolution 247-76 and a resolution amending resolution 279-75. Yes, so we have a series of a last day reports um, recommended by the departments and the county administrative officer and a couple that were report backs um, by your board at the request of your board. Um, it's recommended your board approve the reports as outlined in the memo and take related actions as presented. Um, staff are here from the various departments and are willing to answer any questions. Um, if your board prefers, uh, we can review each of these and take them individually. Any questions from board members on this? No, I just, I just want to highlight, uh, I appreciate all the work and um, the highlight, the additional $210,000 we're spending on our homeless service coordination to support year-round day services. Um, I know this is, was part of, we want to do more, but it's, it's nice to see us moving already. Seeing no additional questions, we'll open it up uh, for the community. Anybody like to address us on the last day reports for the 1819 budget? Okay, we will close that and bring it back to the board. I'll move the uh, recommended actions. A motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Remember item four was moved past item six, so we'll move on to as the Board of Supervisors 
uh, a board of directors, I think, of the Redevelopment Successor Agency to consider and authorize the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector with the concurrence of the county administrative officer to make necessary year-end adjustments and adjustments for the 1819 due to increases and decreases in available financing and approve the proposed 1819 Redevelopment Successor Agency budget, including supplemental and last day items as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the Redevelopment Successor Agency concluding last day report and the last day in concluding reports. That's correct. It's really quite that simple. We recommend your board take the necessary action. It's the final action for the Redevelopment Successor Agency to prove all the information you've received already. Any questions on this? It was great while she lasted. <laughs> uh, anybody from the community like to address us on this item? Okay, bring it back to the board for this item. I move the recommended actions. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor McPherson. Don't all jump in at once. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Moving on to uh, consider the 2018-19 County of Santa Cruz proposed budget concluding actions to authorize the auditor, controller, treasurer, or tax collector. We need to think of an acronym for you. ACNAC. ACNAC. Well, let's skip the acronym, and, <laughs> and we'll stick to the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector with the concurrence of the Mark. CAO to make necessary year-end adjustments and adjustments for the 1819 due to increases and decreases in available financing and approve the 1819 County of Santa Cruz proposed budget, including the supplemental lasting concluding report items as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the concluding attachment list and the last day reports and a number of exhibits. Correct. Um, this item is a summary of all the budget actions that the board has taken during budget hearings, and it provides authorization for the auditor controller and the county administrative officer to make any necessary adjustments as a result of the closing of the 2017-18 books and report back to your board any changes. Oh, yeah. Attachment one provides a summary of the changes in the supplemental last day and concluding reports and board additions and the impact on contingencies. Exhibit one provides the supplemental changes. Exhibit two reflects the last day changes. Exhibit three reflects the concluding changes, including the accounting details for all the various adjustments. And exhibit four reflects a 17-18 realignment of costs for the general fund departments for the data processing charges. Closing actions are detailed and are provided for the current year, 17-18, uh, in items one through five and items six through 27 are provided <coughs> for the 2018-19 budget. And authorize the auditor controller with the concurrence of the county administrative officer to prepare and report back to the board with a final adopted 2018-19 budget. It's recommended that the board approve the 2018-19 concluding report and approve all the related actions as presented. Um, I'd like to thank the department heads and their budget staff for all their hard work on the budget, especially the county administrative office staff under the leadership of Carlos Palacios. So, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. I think we do have one question. Supervisor Leopold? Um, I'm not sure, uh, Ms. Mowry, I don't think you're the appropriate one to ask it, but mm -hmm. when we did the budget hearings, we asked about the Janus contract and what was going on about and getting some information. Mm -hmm. I noticed that Ms. Hall is not here. Um, and so I'm trying to get a sense whether there's any information that can be shared with us at this time. Uh, she's, she's here, she just stepped out, I believe. So uh, she was just here, so I think she just stepped out yeah. for a moment. Yeah. So I don't know if you wanna. Well, maybe we'll hear uh, comments from the public and see if she makes it back mm -hmm. in time. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on this item? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, we can. Well, well, uh, uh, um, uh, I think that the board has expressed that we're concerned about the uh, the negotiations for this first contract at Janus. That is something the board is interested in and, and working towards. Uh, there isn't m money in this budget document to, to fund any increases and. Um, and that's because we have a, a, a just barely balanced budget as it is. We are gonna have an item where we're looking to fund additional things. Um, and, uh, and so that, you know, that is something that's gonna be important for us down the line um, uh, to, to, to hear, um, it looks like in August, to, you know, what our plans are. Um, but I think it's, uh, I want you to know that this board cares about that contract, the settling of that contract. We, I recognize the importance of achieving your first contract, which is uh, 
incredibly hard in this day and age, um, but incredibly important uh, uh, to the people. You've, you've made a very clear case um, uh, for the needs over there, and I appreciate that. And the, if there's a role for the county that we can look into that, but, uh, but I want you to know that we're in your corner to get that first contract. Um, I, I just want to also express my appreciation to, um, uh, to the, all the staff who worked on this year's budget. Uh, I know it's, it's not something that happens in May uh, when we get our first uh, draft of the budget, but it's something that we work on um, uh, for half the year. Uh, and the clarity of the information is, is very good, and I appreciate the willingness of uh, the staff to answer the many questions in which I and other uh, board members had and which we submitted in writing. Um, just appreciate your work and uh, glad that you get to be out here making presentations so we can recognize you for your work. It's my pleasure. And so I would move the recommended actions. Second. So we have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty and additional information on, on the Janus component. I met with the health director yesterday. She did commit to working uh, with your executive staff on ways that there could also augment money coming into Janice that's outside of the county process. She thought that there could be some state and federal money that maybe wasn't necessarily being accessed, but she would need additional time to work with them. Just so you know, there's been follow-up on our end with our county staff to see what is possible also outside of the contract. As Supervisor Leopold noted, our next item is on critical unmet needs, and uh, one of the discussions has been how to fund homeless services, mental health services, uh, substance use uh, disorder services and, and how we can do that. So, so don't leave since that's gonna be the next item anyway. Uh, but I think that having her work with your executive staff on things that she's an expert on might actually benefit even outside of the county process that could benefit you as well. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thanks Thank for you. your great work on that. We'll move on to uh, the next, the final item, which is to consider a report on the county's critical unmet needs and direct the CAO to return on August 7th, 2018 with a further report on revenue options and funding strategies to address the county's critical unmet needs as outlined in the memo of the CAO. This is an item that we had asked the CAO to come back with today. We appreciate your uh, quickness in turning this around, Mr. Palacios, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, friend, and members of the board. Um, I wanted to start by thanking the board um, for the opportunity to be in this position and finishing up my first year as your county administrator um, has been a pleasure. It's been exciting. Uh, there's lots of things we're taking on and lots of things ahead as well. And so um, I just want to thank you for your partnership. I also want to thank you for the thoroughness and diligence with which you have undertaken these budget hearings. I know it's a very um, arduous process. Uh, to go through all the uh, various hearings, but I know the departments do appreciate the opportunity to come before you and present not only their successes and achievements, but also the challenges that they face in carrying out their mission. And that is what I'm here about, is about um, your direction to me to come uh, report to you about some of the challenges that the departments are facing in terms of uh, meeting critical unmet needs. Um, the good news is that uh, we're in a good position as a county right now. Uh, you have been very good fiscal stewards of the public resources. Uh, just to um, remind uh, the public about um, the achievements we have had in, in minding our budget very carefully. Uh, over the last uh, number of years, we have tripled our, uh, our reserves, our general fund reserves. A number of years ago, the board set a goal of 10% of our revenues as a reserve um, amount, and you gave us a deadline of 2021 to achieve that amount, and we achieved it with your leadership uh, three years ahead of time. And so we have, uh, in that time period, tripled the reserves and met your goal three years ahead of time. Uh, we also um, have reduced our pension and health care costs. Uh, this was done in partnership with our uh, labor, um, the labor groups in the county. Our labor partners uh, worked with us and worked with you in achieving these goals. Uh, not only did we Im increase employee contributions for um, retirement, we also increased vesting schedules, changed retirement formulas um, to, the, to the extent that um, we have been able to reduce uh, county liabilities um, 
by over 100, almost $180 million uh, in unfunded liabilities. Um, in addition, uh, there has been state reform uh, that took place actually after the board took action. So the board actually uh, was ahead of the state in this. And that has left us in, um, although um, there are still concerns in the future, it's left us in a relatively good position. Um, we've also, because of these actions, uh, been able to improve our bond ratings. Um, S&P Global ratings increased the county's bond ratings last year to AA plus for lease revenue bonds and AAA for uh, general obligation bonds. And part of the reason for that was not only our strong economy in this county, but also the good management that the county has, as well as the uh, leadership that the board has shown in very conservatively and prudently managing the county budget. Uh, we've reduced um, our reliance on fund balance um, to balance the budget every year. Um, that has been reduced uh, steadily over the last number of years. We've also, um, even though uh, we have been very careful with our resources, we've uh, have been able to fund some of our deferred maintenance. This is a challenge that the county faces as well as many jurisdictions around us. How do we pay for our buildings and our infrastructure um, when there's no dedicated funding source to do that and we have other critical needs? Uh, we have made some progress with that. We've also just finished a, a very large solar project, uh, which is a win-win in that we are uh, reducing our um, global um, warming impact and our uh, carbon Im footprint, while at the same time saving uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, we've also augmented services in other areas. Um, your board has shown leadership in implementing the Nurse Family Partnership, Thrive by Three, um, Whole Person Care, Medi-Cal Drug Expansion. We've increased uh, homelessness services uh, we've made big progress on storm damaged road repairs, and we've also made significant uh, investments in improving uh, public safety. Not only have we hired more deputies, we're actually in the public safety area, are back to our pre-Great Recession uh, staffing levels in the Sheriff's Department, but we've also funded a number of um, major projects, such as uh, Roundtree um, and the um, Blaine Street, and the Recovery Center. Um, nevertheless, uh, during budget hearings, uh, the board he heard from a number of different departments about um, unmet needs um, that are very important to the county's goals and very important to the public. Uh, we have a number of one-time capital improvement needs that we have not met in this budget. We also have a number of ongoing uh, operational needs um, so some of these um, that were mentioned during budget hearings and that are um, the most critical um, include the following. Uh, there's critical matching funds for park improvements where we can leverage uh, state grants and other grants, uh, private grants, to the tune of $4 million. Um, Chanticleer Park, um, this would fulfill the county's commitment to match existing private sector funding of two and a half million dollars in grants and build Leo's Haven, the county's first all-inclusive playground for children of all abilities. Uh, the, ma the money would also uh, fund improvements to surrounding park areas. Uh, we continue, will continue to fund additional improvements that are not reflected in this amount, including a community garden, a picnic tables, a paved lot, security lighting, a water, treat water recharge system, and more. At Simpkins uh, Center, we need a, to do a pool renovation to the tune of $1.3 million. Uh, this is to replace the 21-year-old pool infrastructure, including uh, pumps, heaters, and the deck. These improvements will result in savings in heating costs and reduce water loss from the pool itself. Uh, and improved lighting uh, would make the pool more year-round and offer night classes which would help the center to become more financially uh, sustainable. Uh, the Heart of Soquel uh, Linear Parkway, this $530,000, um, this is matching funds 
uh, that would unlock a $1 million in secured grants and other funding to create a linear parkway adjacent to Heart of SoCal Park. Uh, the farm park, this is $235,000. Uh, this is matching funds, again. Uh, the $235,000 in investment from the county would unlock $460,000 in secured grants to replace the bridge between T Street and the farm park and other improvements. Uh, Felton Nature Park, we, are sh we need $400,000. Uh, our $400,000 investment would unlock $440,000 in grants to fund the design and construction of a nature park adjacent to the planned new Felton Library. The project is the first of its kind in the San Lorenzo Valley, offering an outdoor learning space for environmental literacy program, interactive nature discovery centers, and an interpretive nature loop trail. Um, this would be one of the first local libraries in California to, bear, to pair the many offerings of a modern library with an outdoor educational facility. Aptos Park Facility, uh, we need, we're short $435,000. This would uh, renovate the Aptos Park Community Center, including remodeling the kitchen, upgrading the windows and lighting, additional parking, irrigation, new stairway, and various other improvements. Uh, this would help us to restore the center's potential as a venue for similar events and help us raise uh, revenues. Uh, we also have, uh, besides uh, these one-time capital needs, we have a number of operational needs. Um, we have to fund, uh, in some way, the Homeless Navigation Center. We are short um, $590,000 for the Homeless Navigation Center. Uh, this is to establish a year-round day and night shelter and services centers for homeless in both North and South County. The South County Center would serve approximately 40 adults. The North County Center would serve approximately 150. Uh, currently, we have uh, $290,000 in winter emergency shelter funding, but it is estimated that the uh, year-round navigation center, which would include both emergency shelter and day services, is short somewhere around $800,000. So we're short about $590,000. Uh, we have a need to fund uh, ongoing parks um, operations and maintenance. As we have added parks over the years, uh, we have not added significant uh, maintenance staff. So we're having a real challenge uh, maintaining the parks that we do have, and we're about to add a number of additional parkland. So if we were to put $250,000 towards um, parks maintenance, this would uh, fund three parks uh, maintenance workers and also add some recreation staff to provide additional oversight for new parks and parks improvements as well as to increase youth and senior programmings. These would include programs for disadvantaged youth in the county. And finally, uh, we have uh, what we're calling a focused um, deterrence initiative. Um, the, count, the county uh, currently offers uh, a number of low-income mental health programs, including crisis uh, respite services, supportive housing, drop-in services, and a variety of outreach through the Homeless Persons Healthcare Project, and through, also through downtown outreach workers, mobile emergency response teams, and law enforcement liaisons. Uh, however, uh, as was mentioned by the sheriff um, and the Department of Health Services, there remains a small subset of clients that actually are resistant to services, including, including uh, some who engage in antisocial behavior and criminal conduct. And we are having a very significant challenge in meeting the needs of this group of people. And this is a challenge that's being faced throughout the state. And there's some models who are trying to address this issue. Uh, the sheriff um, outlined a program that he would like to attempt in partnership with the Behavioral Health Unit of the Health Services Agency. Uh, this would um, pair um, public safety officers, deputies with health services agency staff, um, along with equipment and and um, treatment services to meet these, uh, this group, this subset population. And so that 
uh, project alone, we estimate is somewhere around a million dollars in cost, ongoing cost. And so uh, altogether, all of these add up to about $1.8 million. Um, and so we're um, at a point where if the board wants to um, be able to address these, uh, we're gonna have to think uh, more creatively. Uh, we don't have resources in our current budget that are um, untapped. And so um, based on um, your direction, I've come back to you with uh, the most pressing needs. And in, um, in summary, uh, what I would uh, request of the board that you accept and file this report and that you direct that I return uh, on August 7th uh, with the report um, looking at various revenue options and funding strategies that would allow us to leverage uh, these grant funds uh, for capital improvements. Uh, it would be a shame if we were not unable to leverage uh, to come up with money, county funds, to leverage these millions of dollars of revenues and grants that we have received, um, and also um, options for how to improve our operations, um, both in the parks uh, maintenance and recreation area, and also uh, how to fund this focused deterrent initiative program. That concludes my remarks, thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming back uh, so quickly on that. Other comments from board members? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, it's uh, it's hard to believe that you took over as uh, CIO just a year ago because of all the things that have gone on here in the last year. And I want to commend you for uh, your work and vision on coming up with our, our Vision Santa Cruz process and providing the staffing to make that happen. Um, to uh, um, to uh, deal with uh, the um, all the the different changes in uh, uh, the um, solar panels uh, that you've overseen, the investment that you have chosen to make um, uh, in the Leadership Academy for our staff. These are all very positive things for our infrastructure and for the people who make up the county family. And I want to express my appreciation for your work in doing that over the last year. Uh, you uh, lay out here a picture that is um, that's a that's a it's a good challenge to have. Um, it's the, the challenge the, to to look where we've come from uh, since the Great Recession is a good story. Uh, the fact that we've uh, increased our reserves because we need to have the money for fiscal emergencies, as we saw we didn't have during the Great Recession, um, to have that um, uh, ensure that we have the resources necessary and, and improved our bond rating so we spend less money in the future is a great success. Uh, the leadership of this board and working with our uh, constituent labor organizations to make necessary changes that still support our, our um, workers uh, after they retire from here, but uh, balance it out with to ensure that we can continue to provide, provide services on the street is something that we can be proud of. Um, but when, and, and when I look at the neighboring jurisdictions, I feel very good that we're not making the same kind of cuts in Monterey County where they're laying off over 100 uh, staff members and they face tens of million dollars worth of deficits in other jurisdictions which are making cuts. But we do have these additional needs and uh, they're also critical. Um, when I look at, at the capital improvements and see that if we found some money, we have a a two for one deal where we could um, we could double our money uh, if we had some extra money and the impact that could have uh, not just on the location where it's at but for the all the people you know Leo's Haven it's not going to be simply a live oak project it's going to be a project that's going to be enjoyed by uh, children from around the county um, when I think about uh, the work up at the Felton Library I think that that's going to be a place where people are going to seek out to go uh, to, uh, to both enjoy that new library and to enjoy the park next door. But most importantly, the, uh, the, infra the, the need for services for the, the, the issues which are most pressing and which we hear from our constituents on a regular basis uh, around homelessness, around, um, and around uh, helping people with mental illness and substance use disorder, uh, these are critical. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of members of the community who say it's time that we do more than we're doing. We spend tens of millions of dollars in these areas, um, but the, the, the 
the problem is, is bigger than we've seen in the past, and we have to be able to find the resources to be able to fund the programs that will help out not only people in need, but the surrounding community that's impacted by these behaviors. So um, I look forward to um, the, um, the information that you're gonna, you know, we, don't, we didn't give you much time to come up with something. Uh, and so uh, while some of us may be vacationing, it sounds like you're gonna be working a little bit harder. Uh, and I appreciate that. Um, and, but when we come back in August, it's gonna be a big challenge for us to figure out how to pay for the things that we need uh, with money we don't have, it's not easily identifiable right now. So thank you for the work, thank you. Uh, I look forward to this report and I think you've identified our, our key um, uh, challenges uh, for the coming year. Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah. Just very briefly, I think you've uh, effectively identified the major issues that we hear about every day uh, that we need to address. And what strikes me as addition to the, to the real need to address these issues is that a small investment up front, being proactive, can leverage dollars or prevent future costs down the road. And um, you know, there's, it's, not a, it's not always often that you can make smart investments and know that the return is gonna be great, but when you know you can get a small amount of money or a, and be able to leverage that to bring in grant dollars, or if you can actually uh, reduce people who are circulating through our, uh, both our jails and our emergency rooms and causing damage, uh, and we can get in front of that, it's a really smart uh, investment to make. And so uh, I look forward to hearing uh, what we can do to get not only better services uh, to the community and uh, in infrastructure for the community, but also to, uh, to invest in things that will reduce costs over the long term. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'll just uh, reiterate that to the, uh, our capital and, and uh, operational needs. I think it's great that you have identified, I'm, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say in August because yeah, we've come a long way and I've, uh, you're never too comfortable in uh, the budget because I think just because of some issues that are out there that uh, we know we're coming in 2019-20 are gonna be, it's gonna put us in a difficult position. We're gonna lose some money uh, possibly or have to be responsible for more of the programs. But uh, I think that your ability to just say these are the main identified capital and operational needs, but then also saying if we can get there and find out how to get this funding for these, uh, we have a potential of doubling uh, the, out, the, the financial output to provide these services to their county residents. So I really uh, appreciate that outlook. I look forward to coming back in uh, August and uh, seeing how we can just move ahead even further from this budget that uh, I really am pleased with uh, Christina Mowry and everybody who's developed this budget and your staff and throughout the departments. Uh, it's, um, it's good news. It's a lot more fun today than it was five years ago. Supervisor Kaplan. Yeah, I wanna thank you also. Uh, uh, you know, it's been, it's been about a year now, right? That's correct. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> does it feel longer to you? <laughs> Sometimes it does. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, can you explain uh, uh, the different, we have a better credit rating, okay. Uh, how, does that, how does that save us money? Is it like a regular credit rating where you, we, we have to pay less interest? That's correct. When we uh, go out to the bond market, um, because of our credit rating, we pay less interest and so it saves, uh, saves us money. Okay, compared to let's say two years ago, uh, our credit rating was lower. Let's just round it off at a hundred million dollars on something. Uh, what's the what's the difference when it comes to the actual uh, interest rate? Is it a half a, a percent? Is it a a quarter percent um, or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Edith Driscoll, happy to respond. We were in a very different economic time two years ago. So we can't really compare what we receive now in ratings versus what we received then without also looking at the economy. What we can instead do is when we go out to, 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 to sell bonds, look at what our peers are doing and see where they might be getting ratings and where their ratings are. 
um, what kind of bond ratings they're getting based on, on, on where they stand. So we can only really compare today. We can't really go back and compare to two years ago because of the economy. Okay. And then uh, in the same time in the last couple of years, uh, we've not only saved money, but we've also hired more uh, deputy sheriffs, uh, I believe seven, and uh, we're, uh, instead of having uh, one department head running two divisions, so to speak, uh, they all have, uh, you know, department heads. Um, the only thing I would, uh, the only concern I have, I, I, th I think you've done a wonderful job, by the way. I wanna commend you for stepping in uh, you followed somebody that was here for 20 years, and uh, uh, you didn't miss a beat. Uh, we, you know, we kept everything going. Uh, I'd like to see a little more stability in uh, department heads, because we're going through a critical time on, uh, you know, with uh, big issues with uh, public works, with the health department, uh, and, and all, in, you know, in all different phases. So, uh, um, especially the Pajaro River, I want to make sure we, uh, we don't drop the ball because we keep changing to, uh, the quarterback too often. Unless we get a Garoppolo or something to take a uh, step <laughs> in, you know, you never know what you're going to get. So anyway, um, uh, thank you very much for what, it, what you've done. And, uh, you know South County, I know South County, and uh, I think, uh, I think uh, that's, that's helping us out quite a bit because it's a large population down there. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on uh, the critical unmet needs item before we bring it back for direction? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for direction. I, I would move the I would move the recommendations and wait eagerly for the report that we'll see on August 7th. Second. Motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. That concludes our budget hearings and our next regularly scheduled board meeting is August 7th here at 9 a.m. Thank you to Community TV and the Sentinel for covering and for all of you that came today.